I'd like to call this meeting to order. Welcome everyone. Good morning to the regular meeting of uh, Regen Monterey Board of Directors. It's September 22nd, 2023, and it's 9 a.m. So, um, Ida, do we have any just cause notifications, emergency circumstances? Okay. All right. Uh, roll call, please. Chair, Chair Campbell. Vice Chair Shirley. Here. Director Laska. Here. Director Delgado. Here. Director Blackwalder? Here. Director Askew? Here. Director Peek? Here. Director Barber? Present. Director Carlito? Here. We have a quorum. Okay. Great. Um, if everyone can join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance? <laughs> All right, we'll move on to public communications. So anyone wishing to address the board on matters not appearing on the agenda may do so now. Please limit comments to a maximum of three minutes. The public may comment on any other matter listed on the agenda at the time the matter is considered by the board. So please feel free to approach the podium or raise your hand if you are on Zoom. I show no hands. Okay, I'll close public comment. Moving on to consent, uh, we've got seven, eight matters here. So number one is approved minutes of July 23rd, 2023 regular board meeting. Number two is approved minutes of September 6, 2023 special board meeting. Number three, approved report of disbursements and board and employee re reimbursements for July and August, 2023. Four received draft minutes of some, September 6, 2023 Finance Committee. Five received draft minutes of September 6, 2023 Personnel Committee. Mm -hmm. Six approved resolution 2023-09 approving the bank designated signers. Seven approved paint care reuse container agreement amendment. And then 7A rat ratify resolution 2023-08 authorizing Regen Monterey to apply for the power cycle. Fiscal year 2023-2024, cycle 41, household hazardous waste grant program, small grants, small projects grants. Is there anyone from of the directors who would like to pull any of these items? Is there anyone from the public who would like to pull any of these items? Show them. Great. All right. Move approved. Okay. okay, great. So um, a motion by Leo and second by Bruce. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Mm -hmm. Leo, we here. Three, four, five, six, seven. Seven with two absent. All right. We'll move on to recognition presentations. Uh, number eight recognition of 25 years of service for Carlon Hernandez, number one. Good morning, everybody. So my line started. Oh, I'm a supervisor. I don't know that word. So he started with us of August of '98. He's been a faithful sorter. He started as a you know um, Merc One, and now he's at two. He wants. He's waiting for a Merc Three. Froyline, <laughs> <laughs> would you like to say any words? Can I say that, Uh, thank yeah. you for the recognition. Thank you for the recognition. I've been here for serving for twenty five years. Wow. Uh, mm -hmm. We we appreciate your service. We agradecemos mucho su servicio. The job you do is important. We thank you. El trabajo que usted hace es importante y le damos muchas gracias. Great. And then number nine, we have recognition of 30 years of service for Baldo Trujillo, Mr. Facilities Supervisor. I'll make a lot of land. 
Bongo is the backbone of the month. He's been here for 30 years and seen all kinds of changes out there. He was a big part of our success. We're very lucky to have him on our team and thank you for your service. Oh, thank you. I was not prepared, but anyway, so when I started here, I did not, you know, know this was going to be my, my career. My previous managers, you know, I got wisdom a lot from them. So everything I do, thanks to them, and a lot of people that help me here, everything I do, I give it 120%. Because when I do retire, I have nothing, you know, so I, I left everything, you know, I did everything else. And uh, so all the knowledge and everything, experience I know, I'm going to pass it on to my, you know, to the new kids coming up. Uh, but thank you guys. Okay. I'm going to play Great, thank you. And then our next one, recognition of 30 years of service for Martine uh, Renteria, heavy equipment technician. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, as I know, my, my name is Victor Aguilar, the equipment shop supervisor. Martine started working here in September of 1993. He worked on the site crew. But also help working in the old last chance. From there, he came to work for, in the shop as a shop assistant and partner. He was then promoted as a shop technician. He is also a field tech guy who works on Saturdays, responsible for filling and servicing all mobile equipment on site. For the past 30 years, he has shown up to work with a positive attitude and ready to get the job done. Congratulations, Martin, on your 30 years. Uh, I don't have much to say. All I wanted to say is that thank you to the whole uh, region, Moray. I've been here for this short time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we all get old and sometime I guess we got to leave. But uh, anyways, thank you for uh, having me here. My uh, co-workers, supervisors, they're all deserve, you know, recognition to but you know, there's all of us around here, outside crew, Murph, Hazmat, and used to be last chance, but uh, uh, you know, like I said, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you to all of you. Um, moving on to number 11, presentation on public education, social media outreach. Uh, good morning, board of directors. Um, I'm Eric Palmer. I'm the public education and outreach coordinator for Regen Monterey. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me here to talk about one of my responsibilities. And it's my personal favorite responsibility, um, which is uh, managing and curating our social media. I've had several opportunities to talk um, about social media with gov other government communications officials, but this is a really rare opportunity for me to talk about it with the public and with my colleagues um, and the board um, and talk about the strategy behind it, um, which I don't often get to do. And I think you'll come away with understanding how uh, this is another public service that we provide. 
Um, so social media is a part of um, Regen Monterey's communications toolbox. Um, I've been here for um, a year and a half, and one of the reasons um, I wanted to work here is because this organization has had a long time, um, a long reputation, a good reputation for communications and public education programs. We have so many services here, and we rely on the public to help us move towards zero waste. Um, so it's really education is really important, and we do this through outreach to local media. We do tours, presentations with community groups, um, and, and industry conferences. Uh, school education, we attend community events. Uh, we have a website and what goes where app. Um, the middle picture here is our technical advisory crew uh, team at the um, at the landfill. Um, so hauler and government relations is another important part of this toolbox. So we can have unified messaging to our constituents. Um, so we really need to include both in-person, traditional and digital outreach and communications in this toolbox because everybody consumes information in different ways. Um, and part of the reason for this presentation is to show you the efforts we're undertaking as a department and as an organization to improve our digital communications over the past few years. Um, so I wanted to start with, uh, you know, what is social media? I'm sure a lot of you know, but um, it's basically an aggregator of information that you subscribe to. Um, there may be a reason why you like certain social networks over others. Um, each one has their strengths, which I'll get into later. But I'm going to use my personal Instagram as an example. So when you when I open up my app on my phone, this is an illustration of the variety of content that I receive. Um, how it works is brands, organizations, and individuals create what are called pages in each platform. And the pages are vying for your attention um, and your subscription by providing information that is relevant, entertaining, or educational to you. People use these apps to consume information, but also to share content of their own, whether it's family or personal memories or updates, uh, special memories, travel, their artwork, et cetera. Um, I'm not originally from uh, Monterey, so it's been really valuable for me to keep in touch with my friends and family across the country. For example, I on the corner there is my nephew. I don't get to see him very often, uh, but every week I get to see pictures of him and his adventures. Um, I like to follow travel sites like Visit California, give me ideas for vacations. Um, restaurants, I show support to them by following them. They like BS Deck and Salinas is one of my favorites, and they show me the weekly specials, gives me ideas for the weekend. Um, health and fitness is popular. I like running, so I follow the Runner World Runners World Mag magazine. Um, I also get most of my news from social media, so I follow local and national news organizations. Um, in the left corner is the Smithsonian, and they show me an artifact from their collection every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> and, and uh, you know you're getting old when your childhood toys start to become artifacts of the Smithsonian. So I just thought that was awesome. Uh, so as you can see, you can curate um, topics that are interesting to you while keeping in touch with friends and family. Um, and I wanted to share some stats about uh, the major growth and usage of these platforms and why it's important for Regen Monterey and also got any government agency to have a social media presence. So here's a recent Pew res uh, research study. It shows how many Americans are active on social media. So from ages 18 to 64, 73 to 84% of Americans use social media regularly. Um, and you can see that younger generations were early adopters, um, but older generations are starting to show significant growth and regular usage. So residents, your friends, your family, they're all using these apps every day. And while they're scrolling, it's my mission to get them to learn something new about Regen Monterey every day. Um, so why do we use it? Um, again, connecting with fam family and friends has long been the top reason that people use these tools. But in addition to these um, pers personal connections, Associated Press did a a poll last year to see what, what the popular topics users are subscribed to. Um, interestingly, social media is becoming a major source of news for Americans. Uh, physical newspaper subscriptions are down, and um, we're seeing a lot of newspapers, local newspapers across the country starting to fold when they're not being more aggressive with their digital presence. Uh, the advent of the streaming market means that people are watching less live television than the news broadcasts. I'm one of the 48% of Americans that get most of my news from social media. I still read the Monterey County Weekly and buy an issue of the Herald here and there, and I listen to KSU on the way to and from work, but the majority of it comes from social media. There's no more appoint, what we call appointment viewing as much with television. Um, people want short bursts of information throughout the day, um, two to three minutes in between Zoom meetings or while they're waiting in line at the coffee shop. That's 
that's what a lot of us are doing these days. Um, we're also seeing that a majority of Americans are using um, search features of the social media as opposed to search engines like Google to find information. For example, if I'm driving home and I see a plume of smoke um, in Carmel Valley, I'm going to go on social media first. Um, and as a society, we expect our government agencies to um, be on there and be giving us information when there's emergencies like that. Um, and it's often going to be more up to the minute than going to a website because you have news reporters, public information officers, and regular citizens that are posting about what's going on um, in their community. So it's just a really remarkable tool for staying informed and entertained all in the palm of your hand. All right, let's talk about Regen Monterey's social media strategy. When I came on board, I was new to the industry. And what I did is I took a look at what other waste management districts were doing and, with their social media. And what I found was really uninspiring and really bleak. Mm -hmm. um, images of environmental destruction due to wasting plastic, dull photos from public meetings, and or someone speaking from a podium, stock images or recyclables and garbage. Mm -hmm. um, I learned through a community-based social marketing conference that it's really hard to engage with people when it comes to global issues um, because it makes people feel disempowered. And when people look at images like this, uh, they feel like climate change and a sustainable future is out of their control. There's a cynicism to addressing environmental and climate problems. Uh, it's so future oriented uh, and hard for people to relate to in a here and now sort of way. Um, so when I was hired and we, we were in the middle of a rebrand to Regen Monterey, I felt like this was an opportunity to rebrand our social media as well and do something different for a government account and a waste management social media program. Because our logo and our mission and our values, our strategic plan, they're all really hopeful. Um, and that's the direction we wanted our, our social media. So these are the kind of posts that I was looking at doing. I wanted to localize our environmental issue and share content that is more inspirational. Wow them with the scale of our operations and the work ethic of our staff. Remind them why we live in such a special place that's so important to protect and then educate them about the little things we could do at home to um, make that possible. Uh, so we take these big picture climate and environmental issues and translate them into smaller scale, regional and human stories. Uh, so instead of instilling fear, uh, we celebrate our environmental successes as a community. We thank the public and our staff for their contributions to that. And of course, we acknowledge the complexities surrounding the big picture problems uh, described in our mission, um, but ask how do we focus our efforts regionally? Where do opportunities exist for collective action in our community? And how can we inspire other communities by being a role model? Um, so, and special districts really have a challenge because we we're explaining complex and technical information to the public. Uh, special districts are often physically isolated uh, from and represent a huge swath of the population. And yet uh, we're far removed from people's minds. Um, so that's why being a communications official at a special district can be really challenging. Um, when it comes to attracting the social media following. Um, but what, what I came away from uh, when I started here and when I applied was that uh, compared to other special districts, we really benefit from having such a visually rich facility. Uh, it's so colorful, there's unusual things going on. It's, there's massive heavy machinery, friendly and diverse staff are doing a bunch of interesting work. And we can grab people's attention with this imagery with the ultimate goal of um, educating them and building more followers through our social media. And that hopefully means building more community advocates and more support for our initiatives. Um, so if you're not on Instagram or Facebook, I wanted to illustrate what visiting our pages look like. Um, I just really want it to stand out. Um, just like our facility is a model to other waste management districts, I want our social media to be a model for thinking outside the box when it comes to government communications. Um, so yeah, we got videos, photos, um, it's a lot of fun tools, which I'll get into here. Um, Instagram and Facebook, they're photo and video sharing networks. Um, again, I wanna offer content that's different every single day, show different aspects of our operation and inform about services that are available to the, for the community. I want people to scroll through their phone and think, wow, I didn't know that that was going on in our community. Um, share innovations, new programs and regulations, wildlife around our property, uh, introduce the public to staff. Um, that's why I was taking photos here. You know, let's really celebrate the people who've been here for decades, uh, celebrate schools. Uh, they're just endless amounts of content that we could share. Um, a big problem that I often see with government 
social media accounts that's all facts and no heart. Uh, they're speaking to already. They're speaking to enthusiasts of local government already. People like myself with government jargon, housing elements, land use plans, zoning ordinances. Um, it's confusing. So I think it's really important to speak in an authentic and relatable voice. So I try and do that. Um, otherwise, you're just going to lose the majority of our constituents. They're not going to be interested in following what we're doing. Um, and you're only going to keep engaging with people that come regularly to these public meetings. Uh, so that's always the biggest advice that I give to people when it comes to social media strategies is to really keep it authentic and relatable. Um, Instagram is my favorite. It has so many features to keep you engaged. Um, I showed you the types of photography that we share, but the most popular and trending feature is called Reels. Um, they're basically short videos that you can embellish with graphics and music, polls, and other fun features. And I wanted to show you a few examples of the kind of storytelling that we're doing. So this is a sorting challenge that we had during safety week. This is where your plastic bags belong. So three foot narrow. The answer is never put plastic bags in your recycling cart. Regen monitors sorters have to remove your plastic bags by hand. Plastic bags tangle and damage our equipment and disrupt processing. Please help us out. Same with plastic. Showing people showing the, how everything comes to the standstill. So when you show things visually, it can, it's really a lot more impactful. Do we have time for one more? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Example of that really technical, complex information. How can we show it in a vivid, entertaining way to explain the kind of innovations we're doing here? Wood pipe products are loaded into a paralysis machine. It's heated in a low oxygen environment, creating a charcoal like substance called biochar. Biochar is mixed with compost and applied to farmland. Biochar acts as a reservoir for nutrients, microorganisms, and water. Remarkably, biochar can sequester carbon from the atmosphere. Biochar can help rehabilitate and improve farmland and fight climate change. All right, another great feature of Instagram and Facebook is stories, and um, we have these profile pages that have co that has content that's permanent, but these temporary stories allow us to share content from our followers and partner agencies, nonprofits, businesses, and other pages. 
Uh, for example, we share a lot of special events for, about like beach cleanups and webinars that are relevant to our audiences. And we'll reshare when people go on a tour and they give us a little shout outs. Um, we'll share from our member agencies like City of Monterey and City of Pacific Grove. Um, we'll share, the, again, we'll share these little shout outs that we get. Um, so we reshare this Carmel Cares. They're a group that cleans up Carmel. So I like to post about them and say thank you. Um, you know, I'm just saying thank you for to these agencies for doing what they do. And, you know, they reposted thank you for the support. So they really appreciate it. Um, appreciate this. And I try and show that we're good community partners. We're not just posting our own stuff. Uh, here's Mary Bruce with his group on Lapis Road. Um, again, this is a way we build community and demonstrate that we're all in this together because building a strong support of community is essential to Regen Monterey success. Uh, LinkedIn, um, it's, a, our top, it's a top social network for professionals. It works as a professional networking platform and can act like a dis digital resume for many users. Businesses and government agencies use it to build an employer brand. Uh, what we're doing is we're reinforcing Region Monterey's status as an industry leader. Um, why are we a great place to go to work? How do we celebrate our employees? How are we being recognized by local and national publications and industry associations? We post job opportunities. I found out about my job from LinkedIn. So this is a really great tool. Uh, next door, um, they call itself a private social network for neighbors, neighborhoods. And in order to create a profile on the next door, um, you have to be verified as an actual resident of your neighborhood. So unlike Facebook and Instagram, which anyone from around the world can follow us. So this is a great tool. Residents use it to post about safety concerns, volunteer opportunities, garage sales, solicited suggestions for plumbers and landscapers and things like that. But governments can use it as well. And what's great about it is you can geo-target certain areas so I can post to the entire district or certain jurisdictions, um, or you can even get even on a smaller level and target to specific neighborhoods and cities. So um, I don't know, I don't think it's as important to special districts as it's essential to local governments um, because you can post emergency uh, notifications, construction impacts, um, proactive crime prevention advice and things like that. So. Um, if your city's not using this tool, I think it's even more important than any other social media tool. Um, Is that next door? Next door, yeah. Um, so this slide's a little confusing to look at but at first, but I want to share how we use analytics to study what's working, what isn't. We measure impact and engagement by looking at the growth of our audiences um, and how many people are liking the post. But the most important thing is shares. Um, that's really the key to getting more followers. So what I'm trying to do is you create compelling content that people like so much that they're sharing it on their pages. So that's what's important. So this first section here shows that plastic bag video that I showed you all. Um, it's been watched for 2000 times. Um, and that little paper airplane icon shows that it's shared 40 times. Uh, and then down below is how many accounts did it reach? So 2000 and of that, uh, 1,599 were people who aren't following us already. So that's the kind of data that I want to see, because uh, that means that that's how you're getting, you, that's how we're getting more followers and more uh, awareness about Regent Monterey. In the middle, um, up top is the impressions. That's how much people are seeing our posts. So we got 50,000 uh, views in the past 90 days, and then followed by a list of the most popular things. So I can get an idea of what's working and what's not. And then they also do a good job at giving um, demographic information for each platform. And remarkably, 67.8% are women mm -hmm. for region owner. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so social media, uh, it's really the perfect tool to advance our mission and vision and strategic priorities. And I used our well-defined brand values and emotions as a guide mm -hmm. for what I'm doing. Uh, we're in a unique position to engage with people emotionally because residents already have an emotional connection with what we represent, shared values and beliefs in our, in, in our environmental mission, along with support for frontline workers. Uh, check out our brand values. Um, our post will show how all our operations are integrated, how they're effective, efficient, how we introduce, we constantly introduce new innovation that we're reliable and ready for challenges. Um, again, our brand emotions up here. Uh, I wanna illustrate that our facility is full of life and vitality. Uh, that we care for the health of our community and their environment. These are tools to build trust. And we want to use a friendly and authentic voice that is hopeful. 
Um, it's also important to note that besides the experience of visiting our facility, our website and social media are part of the public face of our organization. And we have a longstanding reputation for professionalism and innovation. And that's exemplified in our brand and our logo. Uh, so it's really important to me to ensure that our digital presence is as is perceived as professional as our services and our customer services. So, because I think you can do damage to your organization's brand if you're not being thoughtful and having professional quality standards with these tools that people use every day. Um, and that's why I call this work curating because it's it's about being thoughtful, active, creative, and engaging with these platforms. Um, and so, yeah, I hope I hope you came away learning about social media and uh, how the direction that we're taking it in. Um, I hope you'll follow us and encourage your constituents to do the same. Um, and let me know if you ever need help installing these apps or advising about social media with your agencies. And I want to thank the board for historically having a really strong support for public and investing in public education um, and continuing to show interest and uh, in interest. That's it. Great. Any thank you, Eric. That was fabulous to hear. Um, any comments? Yes, yeah, Eric, I have a couple questions for you. Um, first of all, I'm really impressed by the innovative way you've done this, the colorful way. It is very engaging. And I want to know how to take this back to my city and get it either put on our own website. We're not into the digital media quite yet. We still don't have addresses over there. <laughs> so, but um, I think if we all were given some sort of instruction or, or tool of how we could take this back and add it to our city's websites and the information that goes out. Every Friday, we have a blog and a letter that goes out from our city manager and he adds things, which I think would be valuable. And then and this may already exist, but is there a virtual tour of the MRF that people can access if they can't come out here and climb around and see it? Um, we do have uh, videos of the MRF um, on our uh, materials recovery facility page. Um, we have a photo virtual tour as well, where you can go mm -hmm. around the site and see photos. Um, yeah, again, there's a video. Uh, I think our social media is a great place to go. It has, you know, there's hundreds of posts that people can scroll through and visit all aspects of our operation. Um, for your first question, we'd love if you would share our content. Um, you are able to, uh, maybe somebody tech savvy there or I can help. Um, you can um, embed these feeds into a website. So maybe if you have an environmental page, um, you can yeah. have, um, it'll show the latest posts and it'll automatically put them on there. Um, we have that on our homepage. Um, so that that's one way um, that it could be done. Okay, that's, that's really terrific because I know I've done the tour a, a few times, but I know it's it's not something everybody can actually come on here and do all the time. So I'm glad to know that people can access that because uh, it's really a marvel. And I think when people actually see where their waste stream goes, it may make them a little more conscious about it. Just like these gentlemen that have worked here for over 30 years. I mean, that is really a, a tribute both to them, first of all, but also to the district that um, they have stayed and that they do such vital work. It's something that every single one of us depend on. And I don't think that's always evident in our daily life that we do have these wonderful people taking care of our waste stream and doing well at doing it. So I love the story that you're telling. Thanks. Yeah, and I think that's the idea of introducing people to these folks because a lot of this is done behind the scenes and people drop off their garbage and recycling on the curb and it's out of sight, out of mind. So this is a real good way of um, celebrating them and um, it's good for employee relations too people feel really proud when mm -hmm. when they're shared on here too um, so that's part of the part of the goal too it's 
That's and internal one, benefits. One last thing I was going to say before the gentleman went out so quickly this morning is um, I think it'd be really nice, and maybe you already do this, to actually show them on the job that they do so that it's not just a certificate being held up. We see them fixing machines. We see them sorting. We see what they're doing every day and what they've done every day for 30 years. I mean, that's pretty. And that's what I was kind of talking about earlier is like a lot of social media the governments do. It is those handing off a certificate mm -hmm. or standing at a podium. Um, I It's more interesting to me, just like you said, like when, you know, this give, board meetings give me ideas. So those three, I'm going to find them and and that's what I, exactly what I'm going to do is have show them on the job um, and ask them questions about why they feel uh, why they love working here. And, um, that's a lot more interesting while people are scrolling through the Instagram feed because um, they're only going to stop when something catches their attention. If it's someone holding a certificate, that may not be as exciting as standing next to that scene right there. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Dr. Carpey, you had your hand up. Yes, awesome job. I love it. Um, where are you finding your um, algorithms and your analysis uh, that you showed? Um, so um, Instagram, Facebook, they all have in the settings, there, there is an analytics tools. Okay, uh, so it's not something extra you had to purchase. It, you, we're able to just... Yeah. Go to the analytics tool to find that information. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Right. You have to be a um, a business or mm -hmm. um, organization page. You you couldn't look on your own personal one to see how many. Right, but I'm saying like the city of Monterey, we, I could be able to look on that to see what what type of. Yeah, you'd have to have access to the account. Right. Um, but mm -hmm. they could certainly share that. Okay. Um, Thank you. Mm -hmm. I yeah I I'm. The work you're doing it really does amaze. It's a couple things that I wrote down is creating um, sort of that hope for the future, um, celebrating, um, empowering, and inspiring public. I mean, those connect so closely to the aspiration that I feel like we have as a board about what we are hoping to, you know, put forward. Um, not just you know we're, we're here to accept uh, waves, um, but we're here to really do what we can to like change the trajectory forward, the communication back to the public and doing it in a way that really does sort of step outside of the box. Um, you have a phenomenally talented uh, way that you see our work and are able to translate it back out to the public. Um, and I think, uh, I think it does rise to sort of a, and raise the bar on what we should expect from all of the governments. Um, makes me really proud to be a part of Region. Um, so thank, thank you for the presentation and um, just for like bringing that next level of um, of translation of, of work out to the community. Thank you. Yeah, thank yeah. you. I'm new here, really excited to be here. So this is all new to me and getting out there with the camera and talking to folks has just been a real joy. So yeah. I hope it comes out. Eric, I've followed your career in every step I really love, including this. So good job. Um, there's an uh, American uh, journalist author named Chris Hedges, who I'm a big fan of him. And he says that, you know, we're going to run off the cliff with a lot of hope. And that if we preach hope and we don't tell the reality, that people aren't going to get the reality and they're going to go with the hope. So is there you probably have thought about this. So is there a way to mix heavier, deeper doses of reality with everything you're doing? Yes, and I'm I'm not I'm not steering clear of the environmental destruction and the stats. Um, I'm still including including those uh, figures because um, I still do think it is important. Um, so, so I am finding the mix, but I'm um, what you see in a lot of these social media sites is that's the majority of that content, is, you know, showing the great Pacific garbage patch and um, things like that. So I do think it's important to include that information. And I do, um, I just wanted to emphasize that um, a lot of the strategy is in, including more of that hope, the, the hope. Okay, so my next question is more about policy and that's more of the board's job, but in your perspective, um, 
you mentioned something in your presentation that you you hope to motivate them to know and do the little things around the house they can do. And the policy question is, um, if we don't think that doing the little things around the house are what's going to lower us to below 350 someday um, of uh, emissions, do you think that that's, that's our policy, is that we should teach them how to do the little things around the house? Or should we mix that with a, with a dose of the bigger things that we need to do? Or is that not our district's role? Yeah, well, that's what's great about social media is we can cast a wide net. You know, we're talking about the little things you could do at home, but, um, you know, also as a community, um, how these things build up, um, you know, showing the scale of the landfill and really wowing people with the amount of trash that we're continuing to throw away. Um, so, okay, that's my answer. So making the connection, I guess. If you do the little things, it's part of the bigger ripple in the pond. Correct. Okay. Um, I saw that there was boosting up there. And what's your opinion on spending money to boost? Um, yeah. So, like, what what's great about these tools is they're free. I mean, it's staff time generally. Um, we have boosted here and there, but um, I would say that we've mostly been um, relying on what's called organic reach, which is free. So I think if you, if an agency or organization has the resources, boosting is good. And we typically will do that for, um, you know, during the holidays um, to really emphasize um, the amount of waste that's going on during the holidays and give certain tips. Um, and what's great about boosting is that well, they'll guarantee that they're going to, you can really geo-target it to a certain residents um, and, and things like that. So um, that's, it's a really great tool that um, these social media networks provide, um, but we're generally, um, we're generally not using that very much. So the dollars and cents that I've seen, the little that I've dabbled with boosting is that you spend 10 or 20 bucks and vastly increase. Mm -hmm. So if our, if one of your goals is to substantially increase your, your followers and your shares, and if boosting does it for pennies on the dollars, uh, do you think it would be good for the board to consider a budget that's a little bit larger? I'm talking hundreds of dollars, a few thousand dollars to do a whole bunch of boosting. Sure, I'm sure we could find it in our public education budget as well. Uh, but that's, I think that's a good, a good point that we should definitely consider. Because you're right, it's ten, ten to twenty dollars um, can give you ten thousand new, new. Views. So with all your work going into your product, getting it out is cheap. Yeah. And if you don't get it out, then you're you're not valuing your work as much as you got it out. Yeah. Have you compared to our uh, analogs at the Salinas Valley Waste Authority and Waste Management Inc. Uh, their social media program versus ours? Uh, they're doing a great job. Um, Are they on par parity between the three? I think so. I haven't looked at uh, their follower numbers um, in a while, but yeah, they're they're doing a great job. Um, they have a different style, you know, with more graphics. And I think we have more visuals here. Um, so I, I don't want to compare too much. <laughs> collaboration as yes. well. They, they help each other. Thank you, guys. Yes, we collaborate as well. Yeah, we yeah. we meet regularly and we talk about, uh, for example, illegal dumping um, is common throughout, um, uh, throughout the county. And... Um, yeah, we, we collaborate very often. We have a really, really, really good relationship with them. All right. The last question is because our relationship with the public is so important. Do we have any kind of smart goals relative to your social media outreach? Like Eric Palmer wants to get X and Y and Z by this date of this type of feedback or uh, understanding of how, it, how, you know, how we're impacting what you want to do with the budget that we're spending on it so that we would know we need to spend more money or we would know that it all looks great, but we're not quite where we want to be. How do we get there? Um, I guess I don't have specific metrics that I'm trying to get to yet. You know, I'm, I'm new here and um, I'm proud to say that we've seen growth in over 100% on, on each platform um, since, uh, the, since the rebrand. So just continuing to see the growth and then, um, 
yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I'd have to see, I'd have to see, study more about uh, the followers for other agencies. And um, but my goal for now is just to keep on growing our audience. Well, I see you as the face. Well, you're presenting our face to the public, which is critically important to us, and you're probably doing it better than we've ever done before. So, if if there's more resources or more thinking that can go into it to make your job even better, then we're going to do better as an organization. And that's why I was asking. Yeah, and that's why I, I, you know, we try and share posts from your organizations, and um, you know, sharing sharing our our content would be really appreciative. <clears throat> Right, May I ask for that, Mayor? Um, and Chair, thank you. Um, Eric's really humble. <laughs> he, does a, he does a fantastic job on a daily basis with our social media. And within, I think, the first two or three weeks of being here, he developed uh, on his own accord an, an annual calendar of all of the initiatives. So he looked at you know, what are National Food Scraps Day? You know, what is, what's the day to talk about batteries? And he calendared it all out. And um, I think what we're seeing now is an output of his initial design from his first few days on the job. And this is part of the reason why we hired him. He has uh, extensive videography background, which he hasn't mentioned today, um, but he knows a lot about curating this content and a lot about pushing our mission forward. So I, what you're seeing is just like the tip of the iceberg and there he has a, he has a really solid plan to move us forward. <clears throat> and I think that's what we're seeing. In the presentation today. Great. That's actually what one of my questions I was going to ask is how do you decide each day what, what you're going to post? But it sounds like maybe you have some things planned out. Yes. And what's nice, yeah, there's all these, you know, special days that you see all the time. And mm -hmm. um, that's adding regen moderator to the conversation because what happens is it gets it all gets aggregated. So nice. um this is like pollution pollution prevention week. It's <laughs> California Coastal Cleanup Day tomorrow. Um, so we make sure that um, we have content that, um, you know, Regen's talking about that and that's being added into the um, con conversation nationally. That also helps us um, get noticed yeah. and no, get shared. Yeah, that's great. Um, you know, I, I was just talking to a couple of colleagues who um, still did not know if we could put bags into the earth waste for, for the, you know, I just, it just reminded me how often we have to repeat yes. lessons over and over again. And so I, I, I know you know this. And so, and you do have a beautiful eye for visuals and you tell great stories. Um, I, I feel so fortunate that you're here with us. I, I, and I love the fact that you're using our values and emotions mm -hmm. to connect with people. I think humanizing our social media is, far more fascinating. Although we do have like cool tractors and things like that too. Um, but yeah, being able to show it, I feel like you're able to sort of open up the things that people don't usually get to see, like, you know, seeing the MRF machinery get stuck with plastic bags. Like that's super interesting, I think. And, and that will stick with people. And so um, I, I just, you know, I love the fact that you're balancing education with you know, with values and visuals and, um, it, it, you know, you're doing a great job. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, is there any public comment on this presentation? Okay, great. Thanks again, Eric. Appreciate it. Yeah. Good oh, yes. I should have been making on Mayor Bruce's um, comment about, or the question about um, our our intention as a as a as an agency and as a board to focus on um, individual action versus sort of larger systemic uh, waste reduction strategies. Um, I don't know if it's a conversation specifically for our uh, external communication, but I do think it's a conversation that we've sort of bounced around in a number of ways. And I think there could definitely be more opportunities for us as a board to engage in sort of the sort of the legislative space um, or the advocacy space to the larger systemic issues. So I just wanted to echo my interest in seeing us take some of that on. I don't know where it fits or if we even have the self capacity, but um, I, I think it would be meaningful and significant and um, powerful given sort of the relationship we have with our external communication strategies. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay. All right, we'll move on to um, item 12. Uh, this is a safety presentation for fiscal year 2022-23.
Thank you, Ted. Uh, this morning we have Loriana, who is our safety manager, who is going to be presenting the results for our safety. Good morning, and good morning, um, members of the board. Good morning again. Uh, my name is Lorena Medina, uh, safety manager for Region Monterey. I'm happy to be here uh, to present our annual performance. And like last year, uh, it was presented by uh, calendar year, our performance and the um, and some safety metrics we are doing this uh, fiscal year so that it aligns with our budgets as well as our um, annual costs when it comes to workers' compensation as it relates to injuries and illnesses. So uh, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm not as fancy as Eric with <laughs> PowerPoint, but um, there's a lot of messages that Eric um, uh, passed on that translates and is synonymous to our safety programs because it involves people, our employees, our workforce that can, that sustains our operations. And without our employees and having a safe place to work, we would not be able to effectively do our job here for everyone. So celebrating and empowering uh, our employees through our safety programs as well and creating that trust that they can, knowing that they're going to come to work, go home safely, and, and have the resources to do their job safely is really important. And um, I'm fairly new as well, uh, just two years in, and I am very proud to say that there's been a lot of uh, cooperation and collaboration with all of the teams to improve safety. And, and we can see it in the numbers, but more importantly, we can see it in, in our employees. So last year, I may have overwhelmed everyone with a lot of data, so I, I scaled back a little bit. Um, but we, uh, Region Monterey tracks all incidents versus OSHA reportable cases, which are those that are um, injuries involving medical treatment beyond first aid, and it also generates a workers' compensation claim. So as you can see here in the past three years um, and the start of fiscal year 23-24, uh, of, as of July 1st, um, we see a downward trend. Uh, the fiscal 23-24 has, uh, you're probably wondering, well, just started, why do you have 24 incidents? Um, we had uh, an outlier incident in July involving um, unknown irritant that impacted and affected 24, uh, 20 individuals in our MRF. Uh, they, it required first aid care. So despite the fact that um, uh, it, we were not unable to determine what that irritant was, we did quite a bit of testing and and um, to determine where it came from or what it was, it was it was to to be determined. It was, it was unknown. Um, but those that outlier still is is captured in our incident frequency. Um, out of the twenty we had, uh, three employees that did seek medical care beyond first aid, and two of which um, became a first aid case, I mean, a, a workers' compensation case. And the third workers' compensation case, which is the OSHA reportable there, is involves a slip, trip, and fall. So um, removing the outlier, we would be at uh, 14, in, 14 incidents uh, for the new fiscal year, and um, which is uh, I'm sorry, four incidents uh, for the, I don't know, like, I'm getting lost here. Um, so removing the 20 uh, incidents, um, we would have four incidents uh, as of July 1st. So uh, if you can, if you see the, uh, after coming out of the COVID year, fiscal year 2021, the, we saw an increase in incidents and injuries, but that is Typical uh, when our headcount increases, and also uh, the uh, the um, enforcement and 
enhancement of reporting procedures. We want to know everything, even if it's a paper cut. We want to know what, where it happened, how it happened, and, and what we can do about it. So that that uh, information is valuable to us to determine where frequency occurs and address those uh, potential safety hazards. So the uh, then it starts dipping in the previous uh, fiscal year, um, and then the OSHA recordable cases are. Um, are also re reduced in previous fiscal year. Oops. So that translates into our workers' compensation program, our risk management program, where the insurance, our insurance carrier SDRMA uh, looks at all of our claims and uh, provides us an experience modification rate. The last three years have been quite high and we are trending and expecting to uh, close the, the current fiscal year at 1.1. Um, the number of claims have also reduced as, as well as the total pay. You'll notice on 2020, uh, fiscal year 2021, um, five claims at $38,000 paid that's an average of seven seventy six hundred dollars per claim. All of those are uh, closed, so there are no open claims for that year. Twenty one, twenty two, we have one claim open. Um, all ten claims average about fifteen hundred apiece, and the twenty twenty two year has um, five claims open still. So there's still some development in that uh, policy year uh, for a total paid to date or through July first, uh, fifty three thousand. Uh, the current policy year has three claims, and those involve the um, um, some minor um, first aid, or not first aid, but uh, minor claims, such as the respiratory cases, uh, where they went to the doctor once or twice and were discharged. Uh, to As of the date that I ran that report, nothing had been paid, so uh, we don't expect it to be uh, uh, high value as well. Um, and I thought I'd, I'd show in comparison the um, the experience modification rate for a region in, in the past 10 years versus all members of SDRMA. Our goal is to be at 1.0. That is the average. Uh, anything below obviously is great, but anything above uh, indicates that we are having a lot of accidents and injuries and claims. So they look at that. The SDRMA has also um, added new, uh, a new member to their loss control group, which is now assigned to this area, uh, whereas in the past they didn't have the resources to really spend time with their members. And now they have a dedicated person for this region. And, and that person has come out here already and assessed our location and, and uh, provided a report praising all of the enhancements to our safety programs and the, the, the safety performance and had a glimpse to see uh, the event that uh, Eric showed in the video, and I'll get to that in a little bit. But um, that also provides us uh, additional resources to reach out to in case we we need their uh, expertise in other areas or at least um, procure some resources. So I'm really excited about uh, the further partnership with SDRMA. Our, our safety targets were established by for the calendar year. So um, it's not going to align with the current data that I just presented by fiscal year, but this is the process that we go through to um, establish some goals, some targets, and we compare it to industry data as well. So total incident frequency rate, our goal is to reduce it by 10%, meaning we're not going to exceed more than 50 incidents. That's all incidents. It doesn't matter if they went to the doctor or not. It's everything that's reported. Um, we're on the track. We have one quarter left to meet that goal. Uh, the OSHA recordable case frequency also to reduce by 25%, which is not to exceed seven. That is an ambitious goal. Uh, and so we just hope to uh, stay on track and meet it uh, in the next three months. Uh, the uh, total incident rate is really important as well because we that is also an indicator for regulatory agencies such as OSHA to flag companies that have high industry, uh, um, high incident rates. The um, US Bureau of Labor and Statistics for Waste Management and Remediation Services 
incident rate uh, uh, is 3.1. So our incident rate has historically been high. So the goal is to just continue to reduce it. Well, we have we have time. Well, we'll need time to get to that industry average, and I hope to do so uh, soon. But that is the target to get closer to um, the 3.1. Uh, we are um, our average TIR for um, for the last three years has been uh, 6.4, and the last three year uh, fiscal year. TIR average has been 5.2. So we're hovering over, um, we're trying to get it into that that target, and I and I'm I'm confident that we will we will achieve that. And that will be a, quite a bit, uh, a huge stepping stone to then set next year's target, which will get us closer to the industry average. So and what are we doing to get there? Well, we've done quite a bit. This past year we've I uh, have focused on engineering controls, safety controls to um, uh, improve employee safety. One which may you, some of you have seen out in the uh, landfill. We previously, our landfill spotter was on the ground um, managing and directing traffic. And well before the, uh, the Gonzalez uh, landfill fatality, we had already recognized the inherent um, hazards that exist there for the um, spotter roll. Um, they were required to walk to and from trucks, um, often to get paper waiver forms signed for assistance, and that also increased the risk. So we decided that um, elevate, creating a safety zone, um, installing a, uh, a um, uh, elevated platform, a steel platform that sits four feet off the ground with proper railing steps, fully equipped with fire extinguisher, first aid kit, all the necessary supplies that he needs. And also it, it provided us a, a place for a rem, uh, public reminders for our landfill safety rules and our liability notice. That was um, a, a, a great effort with communications and public uh, education to create the language and through council um, to advise uh, all our customers that we are glad to help, but we will not be responsible for any damage that occurs in the process of that request. Um, and all of our commercial haulers have, have signed the, the new liability notice. So we have very few opportunity to have to be boots on the ground to walk up in between the trucks that are, that are at the, uh, dumping at the landfill. Uh, we've mitigated that risk significantly um, and our commercial haulers have were grateful. They were, thank God, we don't have to sign that waiver form every single day that we show up at the landfill. So it was a win-win. Um, and of course, we're reducing paper. So uh, that that was well received by our landfill spotter, uh, Leroy uh, Roach, uh, who just recently uh, celebrated his 10 years. Of 10 years right? mm -hmm. He is... Um, everyone's friend out there and he definitely is the epitome of landfill safety. So he's much appreciated that of this project was, was completed and we have a second one in, uh, in the progress for the winter pad, the winter season. The other uh, engineering controls that, that, um, that uh, just recently took place, but it was in the planning uh, was the Merck tip floor. So the, uh, the, the, uh, Engineering department working with the MRF team to improve the um, the tip floor is immense because we had uh, incidents and injuries involving um, uh, manual um, uh, pushing of the carts or just walking on that terrain. Uh, the 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 material that they have to pull out of the tip floor, things like that, wasn't the the best. Um, it didn't lend itself with the tip floor being uneven uh, across the floor. So now that the floor has uh, been resurfaced and, and we have new concrete, everyone is feeling um, much safe. And of course we have fewer complaints from the vehicles as well, the, the public, but certainly we have um, mitigated quite a bit of material handling injuries. I um, this on this slide, I want to uh, toot our horn a little bit. Um, we safety does we don't have uh, 
yet a strong presence on social media, but we're working with public education to promote more of what we do. And uh, and I'm not sure if the, the board of directors uh, knows that we have a talented team out there uh, that is part of not only the emergency response team that works with our local responders, uh, North County Fire District, the uh, Monterey County Sheriff's Department, but we have uh, an excellent fire brigade team. We, to date, we have 39 fire, fires reported. Some of them are just smoke. Some of them are actual flames that the team knows what to do uh, from the loader to the, um, uh, the site team to the work maintenance team. The, there's different members that make up our fire brigade and they put out these fires. Not once have we had the uh, fire department come out here and put out a fire, uh, at least not in the last year. So they are very equipped and trained to respond and we have procedures for different types of emergencies. Um, fire being the most prevalent, uh, it, it, it is something that we take seriously. And I think that with the continued education to our communities about batteries and throwing things of such nature in our trash can um, will mitigate that. We are, uh, many of our individuals, um, we are our flash certified. Yeah, we have a confined space specialists, our hazmat team, uh, uh, first aid CPR, and our traffic control. And we, we have more and more uh, customers coming through. We have a demand to be uh, to enhance that training with our new uh, new employees that are coming into our site team that's responsible for that. So, shooting our home in there because. Along with knowing that everyone is doing their job at the MRF and the landfill, we also have those same members with these types of responsibilities. Wow. Last year, we, I reported that we had uh, invested in some software to improve our data integrity and uh, record keeping. And Intellects has been the software that um, provides data compliance tracking and record keeping. It's um, it keeps all of our incident reports, whether and tr tracks our investigations, uh, and near misses, all injuries, illnesses, spills, property damage, and incidents, including the fires that I just mentioned. Uh, um, also, we invested in Intertech Alchemy, which is the interactive learning management system. And it's it's a it's used with a remote where the um, employee is learning the subject, answering questions on, on the spot, and the system is recording their knowledge. And and we can uh, also have a um, a fun little challenge at the end, which allows them to retain that information even further because at the end they know they have bragging rights that they they won and they're the champion and they know the information or at least they were the quickest with the remote. Um, but it's, it's, there's fun ways to be able to uh, provide that education uh, when it comes to safety. It's not always, doesn't always have to be boring as many say, oh, safety training today. And they, you know, they, they cringe, but it's become um, an exciting thing now because they like that, that competition, that challenge, and it comes with that knowledge retention. And year to date, we have completed uh, almost 600 training courses, uh, uh, more than the previous year. So we have a lot of um, uh, training that we go through, not only the required compliance that, uh, that OSHA uh, expects us to have, but we have increased our specialized training that you saw in the previous slide with confined space, uh, hazards. Um, and most recently, active shooter within the Monterey County Sheriff's Department. The um, to dove on um, to to kind of a spin off on Eric's uh, in a, um, engage employee engagement. We also wanted to um, uh, establish an annual calendar, and a lot of the training and the safety events are based on an annual calendar uh, with other national events. So we are, uh, this is our second year supporting National Safety Month with the National Safety Council, as well as Safe and Sound Week, which is an OSHA nationwide event. Our second year uh, performing uh, or contributing to this event and 
um, really building excitement about around these themes. Um, the most recent with the 100 Days of Summer and, um, and celebrating our Safety Champions program as well. So. I love to talk about Safe and Sound Week because every, uh, this is our second year uh, participating and everyone, all the employees were looking forward to it. Uh, last year, we um, we had events every day of the week and it was no different this year. Day one, we kicked it off with, with the uh, Safe and Sound uh, promotion, information, the purpose of it, uh, some swag, some giveaways. Day two, we did uh, our safety committee members did safety observations. Uh, day three, we had the uh, Alchemy Safety Tournament, which is the uh, the learning management software. So there, there, there was there was employees there were employees that were just waiting to beat the previous champion, and it is a competition. <laughs> and so um, you can see there there are they were excited to be part of that, and uh, you know it doesn't hurt to get a little bit of rises at the end. And uh, the fourth day uh, was the Recycling Sorting Champion. Last year, it was a competition with the, uh, the heavy equipment operators. And, you know, the, the female operators gave the guys a run for their money because uh, uh, we had one um, female operator and one male operator that took first and second place. So, but it didn't allow everybody else who doesn't operate or is qualified to operate a heavy equipment to partake in a competition as such. So this year we thought, okay, let's open it up and be more inclusive. And we did this, the recycling sorting challenge was, which was uh, a lot of fun. Eric showed you the video and so we'll go ahead and see uh. it. But it was a lot of excitement around it. And there were six teams and they all came up with their names and it was just a lot of com camaraderie around the focus of performing this challenge safely, as well as knowing and understanding the concept beside, uh, behind the recycling. Um, sorry. So to close, um, our safety strategy action plan aligns with the region Monterey's uh, strategy action plan, which is uh, expand our safety culture to ensure an accident and injury free site. So people go, so people can go home safely. It's very simple to the point and, uh, and, you know, it's often said, well, you can never have a place that's accident or injury free. Uh, and, and we beg to differ. And we are working towards that uh, in that direction to ensure that we uh, keep our promise to our employees that we do everything uh, possible to um, identify, correct, and take action and support our employees when they do bring concerns to the table. Um, we are um, we have regular uh, departmental and safety wide uh, safety meetings. And in addition to safety committee meetings, we provide our safety metrics to all the departments because they all like to see how they're doing. And we also uh, um, uh, we're also promoting a learning culture that encourages reporting of all incidents and near misses. Uh, and you see that in the data because um, from the first year that I started to the next, that number went up uh, even though the, the severity went down. And that just goes to show that the trust level has is building so that they are reporting incidents and we're able to address early rather than after the fact. So. Um, so I'm very proud to be part of this team. I'm very thankful of all the resources that Regent has provided to support the safety department and all the members in it. And um, thank you very much. Questions? Thank you, Lorena. Uh, directors, questions? I'd just like to say this is very impressive to know the extent of the outreach to the employees as well, because sometimes we forget the employees actually have some really good ideas about how to do something. So um, I'm glad at the, at the end there you talked about um, getting together and, and addressing things that employees bring to you. But that's really important. Yes, I, I agree. And um, you might notice the picture in the back there. Those two ladies 
They've been with a district for some time and they were teaching me how to clean the screens. Yes, we have the equipment <laughs> properly locked out, just FYI. Um, but I, they're, they're remarkable women because they are in those conveyors or the, the screens, getting all of that stuck plastic and wire out of there uh, within the 30, 30 minute window that they have that while the other crew is eating their lunch. So there's a group of folks that do that job and it's very impressive because it's hard work. I sweated so much doing it. So, <laughs> but it was very interesting to see the challenges that they go through to do that job. And it helps me um, create better ways to do, it, to do it safely. And I do have one question because I'm kind of new at this too. What is an OSHA reportable incident? So it, when a, when an injury requires medical treatment beyond a first aid, uh, it it's required to report it to the uh, insurance carrier as well as track it for our end of year compliance reporting to OSHA, the you know, Occupational Safety and Health Administration. So if it meets the definition of a OSHA recordable case, which is anything beyond a first aid, a hospitalization, um, a serious injury, those are cases that have to be reported to the government essentially. And so, thank you. Uh, yes, very good uh, presentation. I appreciate the um, the graphic because I love I love the I'm I'm very visual, so I love the graphic. Um, so I was uh, wondering um, during the the safety lagging indicators uh, by fiscal year. So from 21 to 22, 22 to 23, um, do you think, well, really from 21 to 22, do you think that the COVID impacted that at that time? I know 2020 is when it, it all started, but do you think COVID had any type of impact on the incidents and illnesses uh, reported? Um, I correlate the increase the, or the increase of between those two fiscal years uh, with the increased headcount. Uh, and also the the heavy emphasis on injury and illness for, uh, for reporting. Mm -hmm. I started at the end of 2020, I'm um, 2021. Uh, so my I hit the ground running promoting that uh, just so that not only to re reinforce the um, uh, the message that's important to know everything, mm -hmm. but also to get to know the work environment. So there was a lot of a heavy campaign in, in the importance of that. Okay. And so, yes, maybe there was a lot of reports of very minor, but those are the ones that we need to address because OSHA doesn't see the 137 right. uh, incidents. They only see, oh, you had seven and six, but right. that doesn't paint a picture. So we're, we're using the total incident frequency mm -hmm. to assess what our risk is and what the real activities are, or uh, incidents are occurring out there. Um, okay, excellent. And so the other part was in 23-24, and you kind of started to allude to this, mm -hmm. uh, is there, since it's such a high number already in the 23-24, because being at 24, comparing it to the 36 from uh, the last fiscal year, mm -hmm. are, is there a concern there? Mm -hmm. I, I I guess the disclaimer would be that we had that outlier uh, incident mm -hmm. where one incident involved 20 employees mm -hmm. uh, and they were affected and received medical attention. So not really because of the outlier. I, I guess that would be the only distinction to say if we remove that outlier mm -hmm. because it's not a regular occurrence that we have. Right. In fact, it, it's the first time I've had ex that experience here since I've been here. Um, we would be significantly less, okay. and it would be uh, we would be trending downward as expected because of all the increased education, training, and and uh, the just the safety management that exists. Um, okay. All right. Thank you. Oops. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, can you put that first slide up that showed the bar graph? Sure. So uh, in the year that we had the increase of 11 employees, that's about a 10% increase in employees, but it's over a two-thirds increase in incidents and a 40% increase in OSHA. So I, I think that maybe it's more of the second uh, purpose, the second reason that you mentioned. It's not the headcount that went up, because that only went up 10%, but the, the other stuff that went on as far as 
encouraging more reports, maybe that was it. Um, but I think the important thing on that graph is that it started to decline. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have any outlier events in any of the three previous years? Any events, any incidents that you know injured five or more people at the same time? Um, no, I would I would say no because I've been tracking the last five years um, just to have a real uh, uh, an accurate picture of of our incidents, and I can confidently say no that this was definitely an outlier. Okay, can you go to the next slide with the safety lagging indicators? My take home from that is that it's it's really a dollars and cents. It's nothing. So really, the impact there is the the injuries that the employees are experiencing. That's what matters in this case, right? We're not worried about this money. It's not hundreds of thousands or correct whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, guys, you want to? See? Uh, historically, it was at those higher levels. So there's been a trend um, since uh, about 2016 downwards in the dollar amount. Yeah, you're, you're missing a, a little broader picture. Where <laughs> historically, it was uh, significant. Yeah, well, that's a take-home message that it was good is good to know because this is showing me that it's that's nothing about dollars that we need to be considered here. It's just uh, the other the, you know the human impact. Mm -hmm. Can you go to the next slide? Did you have a goal for the total incident rate? Like you had a goal for the other two? Our goal is five point eight. Or, I thought that was your your met that was your that was your uh, data five point eight. I thought. No, that is our goal for this calendar year. Oh, so your target is our 5. target 8. is five point eight. Okay, and yes. our the industry average is three point one, and I put it there too so that you so to put it in perspective that we're not there yet at the industry average, but we're trending in that direction. Okay, so uh, if that's the goal, what's the data the last few years? Where where have we been? Nine, nine point, the, the historically the five-year average has been 9.1, 9.2. So we are, we are trending downward significantly since 2020. Okay, so you want to get to at least 3.1, you're at 5.8, coming from something around nine. Okay, great. All right, I think just one more question on the, um, the, the sorting com competition. Mm -hmm. uh, they it looked like some might not have gloves, but it, but the gloves I did see they were really thin, and when they're going really fast like that in real life, if they're on the sorting line or something, is it true that the faster you go, the more you can get poked by sharks? There is a potential even with the with the thicker gloves, and on the lines they they don't use just the nitrile gloves; they use um, thicker working gloves. Uh, so during the competition, it was very warm that day. Uh, and I know a lot of people didn't want to use gloves because it was hot. It was unusually hot that day. But um, we allowed them to use uh, gloves and uh, the um, the material for the most part was clean. We were pretty selective on what we dumped in there. And I know I know Jay had a good time picking out all that garbage, but uh, but we wanted to make sure it was safe. And we we didn't we excluded all material that could potentially have any nails or anything like that. So it was cardboard, um, rigid plastic, and um, um, P PET, the milk right. bottles, I mean, well, milk gallons. Is, thanks. Yeah. Sometimes I joke around it, safety third, so you have, you have fun and you get, and you're productive and then yeah. safety, and that's just kind of a yeah. joke. Yeah. But, but this experience, it's, it's kind of like having fun and being productive and safety wasn't the front of the mind there during the competition. I just hope that it doesn't transfer, you know, because the human the human tendency, we even at work is to move fast, produce a bunch, and you feel more productive because you've done more. And, and I hope that that doesn't encourage that sort of culture in the reality of job. I, you know, I would say, I don't think I felt that was the, the feeling everyone had. Uh, I think above anything, they were learning about the actual sorting, the, those that don't sort in, at the MERM. Mm -hmm. Of course, the winners were people from the sorting lines, <laughs> but there were many others that uh, didn't even know that that's how we sort. Yeah. And so it was educational, it was, it was fun, and uh, it definitely was a morale booster and, uh, and just a, a, another little, you know, um, I don't know, 
little token for safety and and um, and making it fun for everyone. So that's great. Well, that's all my questions. You had a comment. The last page is talked about the transparency of safety metrics, and yeah. I think that's right on. And that's the point I was trying to make about the social media. I think that every employee should know where they're trying to go and sort of be accountable if they get there. And if not, you know, how, why not? And how could they get to their next target? Um, but I, I'm really happy to see these metrics because that's how you measure, yeah. you know, how, how successful you might be. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to uh, reflect back on one of the questions, which were there, um, multiple employees affected in prior events. I want to confirm that in the years that I've been here, there has not been such an event. And this particular event at the recycling facility was the consequences of um, an improper material uh, being delivered uh, to the district for, for uh, you know, along with a non-hazardous waste. It was basically a, a substance uh, that's that uh, was likely to, needed to be in the HHW collection program and not in the non-hazardous uh, solid waste uh, processing that the, the uh, employees do here. So there's a, a, a note or a message to the district about its load checking program. And um, uh, so there, there's other actions being taken in addition to safety response. I have one other question. When you compare it to U.S. industry, are these duplicate to what we have here? All the different parts, or are they? Is that just sort of a generic term? It's um, it's quite generic because we're unique that we have we're not a standalone operation where it's only a MRF, it's only a landfill, and the the Bureau of, of uh, Labor Statistics does break it down. Uh, by collection service or uh, household hazardous waste. And so when I look at all of the numbers, um, they're lumped under waste management and remediation services, and they have that number. And so I took that at, as a collective number, which is very, it's, it's in line with all the others. In fact, I think the uh, um, more stringent incident rate uh, is for collection services, the, the, the haulers. Um, so yeah, I didn't use that number because we definitely don't do that. Uh, so kind of looked at the other services that they do um, uh, identify, and that this is the average number. And is there one area here that seems to be more prone to accidents than others? The entire site is is has many hazards. Um, there seems to be um, perhaps more soft tissue injuries at the MRF because of the repetitive motion and the material handling. Um, the other operations are not that, they don't have many incidents. Uh, I think when you're operating equipment that you, the risk is is also, uh, well, the risk is low, but the severity is, is high, it's catastrophic. So all it takes is one, right? Versus if you have, uh, if you sprain your wrist sorting, um, that may not be as high severity, even though we might have many cases of it. But in, in reality, we for as much sorting that we do, we don't have that many um, upper extremity uh, injuries at all. So, um, thank you. Yeah, the question I had actually is, is relates to that a little bit. I'm just wondering, I mean, you've done a great job of getting the instant rate down, and it seems like you're doing a wonderful job in terms of educating and encouraging people to report and probably making it easy to report. So I'm just wondering, is there anything that we need to provide you to, to continue to help get these incident rates down? Is there additional equipment that people need? I mean, it seems like they're getting the proper training. Is it what what do you see is is um, something that maybe we could do to help help lower that incident rate? Right? Well, certainly we've we've accomplished two major ones with the Merck tip floor um, being repaired. Mm -hmm. That is, that was huge. Uh, that will definitely make an impact. And uh, um, nothing stands out as a, a major um, uh, 
item that we really need that we don't have. It's continuing and building on what we do have. That's that is seems to um, tip the scales now, and uh, partnering up with public education to be a bit more aware of mm -hmm. create and increase that presence yes. um, via social media and also internally. Um, we, you know, I do my best with my limitations with the technology, but there is opportunity there, and I think that we're on the right track. Um, there's a lot of collaboration that's in the works. Yeah, no, I, I think that's great because, right, we we need to get the public community, you know, understanding and educated so that they can keep our our workers safe right. too, and so that they can also be safe when they come to our facility as well. So, yeah, great. Um, okay, thank you so much. Are there any public comments or questions about this presentation? Okay. A uh, question about board members going to training. Uh, many years ago, if we as board members went to trainings, it fairly significantly reduced the cost of insurance the district paid. Is that still a reality? Yes, very much so. Huh. We, so I haven't heard us. <laughs> I haven't heard us being encouraged and know and being alerted to the opportunities for training and the fact that it lowers the cost. Mm -hmm. So that would be nice to know. We can definitely um, uh, provide that information and encourage, start encouraging the, the board members to yeah. to one know about it because it's out there and to the benefits and the uh, the return on the investment because your time and your participation in these these events that are happening through the California Special Districts Association uh, not only is it valuable but it it provides a lot of information that you would is beneficial for your own um, responsibilities but it will definitely bring our pre workers' compensation premiums down year after year. So, yeah, please invite us. Yes, <laughs> we will do. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's when we look at all the training, there is a cap as to how many points we can get for reduction. Mm -hmm. So internally, we try to do it before we bring it out externally. So we, we have been working on it, and if we need it, definitely, we will be reaching out, but we've had this conversation back and forth as to how far out do we want to branch out to, to get this reduction. And so far, we've, we've uh, done a really good job of, of maximizing the points. We got nine out of 10 last year. I mean, internally, you mean staff? Staff doing the training. So, um, and that's not having Felipe even doing the training yet. So we're hoping this year we get 10 out of 10 using various means without having to take up your valuable time. So all right, thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Presentation. Appreciate it. All right, we're moving on to the next one. Uh, item 13 report on employee survey results. And we have a who will be presenting these results and the end very bottom oh there you go thank you Well, good morning, Vice Chair Shirley, members of the board. I, it is my pleasure to present you with the results, a summary of the results of the 2023 employee survey. Uh, so the district has historically um, been conducting this, repeating the same survey for uh, since the same exact question since 2016. We've added a couple questions. Um, we added one question in 2018 um, because we had transitioned or we were in the middle of transitioning with uh, MRF, the new MRF. And uh, there are a lot of other changes happening. We added the question about how do they feel about the recent changes? And since then, as you know, we continue to uh, live through many uh, new activities and changes, change in leadership, uh, senior level uh, changes, as well as um, adding new members to the teams. We included the same, the same question this year. Um, and we didn't do the survey in 
2020 as, as planned, our, our, our intent is to do it every other year. So 2016, 2018, we should have done it in 2020, uh, but because of the COVID and the many other changes that we were experiencing at the time, uh, there was too much turmoil and we decided to um, hold off until things settled down a bit. And so in 2023, things are settled. We have a new, ma new manager, the new team is in place. Um, we thought this would be a good time to um, bring the survey back. Do you think we're not sharing online, so I'm trying to. Oh, okay. Do you want me to Do you want me to share? Yeah. I think we missed the share screen. Yeah. Uh, where is it? It's up on the top. Okay. Yeah. No. Share right, top, right. top right. Okay. Right. Right. Thank mm -hmm. you. And it's not going to work that's sharing it. That's emailing it. Oh, yeah, I'll open up the meeting screen there, Ida. Memos. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. All right, so here we are. I'm driving, I'm driving. Now you're driving. And all right, so the survey um, is comprised of 14 multiple questions. And the questions are written in the form of affirmations um, and, and two additional open-ended questions to capture any other uh, sentiments, uh, feedback uh, that are not covered with the 14 original questions. Uh, the, the survey was submitted to all employees except managers. So managers and uh, directors are not uh, participants in the survey. Uh, we offered the survey anonymously and it was sent through uh, SurveyMonkey for all employees who have an email account. Uh, for employees who do not have an email account, we printed hard copies and those were distributed by the employees' supervisors. And we provided the supervisors the exact amount of, of forms for their teams for them to distribute. Um, we made sure that the forms were color, specific color, so that the forms, would, uh, there wouldn't be extra copies uh, around. And uh, the employees who had the hard copies um, were to turn in the completed forms into a locked box that uh, we had at both break rooms. So we had the key, we opened them, we retrieved them, and we collected the information from uh, the Survey Monkey uh, for, from those who completed it online. Uh, So here's the, are the stats of the uh, participation and response rate uh, from 20, 2018. There were a total of 93 um, non-managerial uh, employees who were invited to participate. Um, we did not have a very great response. Uh, 45 employees completed it, 48%. Uh, this year, we had 109 employees invited and 82 of them completed it for a 75% uh, return rate. Um, benchmark, a good, a good benchmark would be 65%, so we exceeded it this year. Uh, I do have to um, uh, disclose that one of the departments, the MRF, the, the high percentage return rate really is attributed to the MRF. So, and, and that is the department that, that, that houses the most employees. So more, about 50% of our employees are MRF. The supervisor at the MRF, who you met this morning, Baldo, who was recognized, rather than hand out the form and say, here you go, take it, fill it out, there's the box, make sure you turn it in. He said, here's the form, sit down, fill it out, and we're going to turn it in before you go on tour. <laughs> so that really, uh, we had a high, high rate of return for MRF employees. So we definitely learned from this experience, and I think for the, the following um, survey, we're going to 
recommend to the frontline supervisors to to follow Baldo's lead. So, <laughs> uh, so here's the analysis. Um, here's here's the, the the what we need to do to continue. Uh, let's keep it up. Really great uh, feedback. Um, interesting. The most positive the the question or the affirmation that received the most positive response. Um, with a 95% uh, either responding to strongly agree or um, agree <clears throat> was the um, question or the affirmation as it relates to my manager trusts me to do what I need to do or to do the right thing. So this tells us that there is really great relationship uh, between frontline supervisors and managers and their employees. Uh, second top uh, question or affirmation is pride in region work. I am proud of the work that I do at the, at the district um, and uh, just uh, proud of the region overall. So lots of pride from our people. Um, and the work that Eric has been doing to educate externally, he's also been doing a lot of that internally. So I think people are really feeling good about you know, um, being recognized for the work that they do. Uh, region is an employer choice. I get the third top uh, response or affirmation, and this was in relation to the question of um, that they would refer friends or family to work at the at the at region. Uh, relationship with supervisors, number four, um, and this was a question in regards to. Um, the open and uh, respectful, trusting communications with their direct supervisor. Job training resources, tools. Uh, these We saw a huge improvement in uh, several of these from the previous uh, survey in 2018. Uh, employees feel that they, are, or the participants or respondents feel that they receive sufficient job training for their jobs, that they have the, the right resources that are needed, and that they have the, the tools that are needed for their jobs. Uh, and then there was also uh, some new positive uh, feedback that relates to employees feeling uh, that they are recognized for doing a good job and that um, uh, the recent changes are, are headed in the right direction. So, um, Hundred and nine eighty two eighty two employees um, participated, and you can see that there are some similarities uh, or consistent responses from the, the with in regard to pri uh, pride in region work. Uh, the relationship with their immediate managers and supervisors is also very very uh, good in twenty eighteen. And third was uh, region being an employer choice. So here, here are the opportunities or the areas that, um, you know, and generally this was a really great um, response and very positive response. Um, but we know we also want to look at the areas that didn't rank as high. And so here are the top three. So the, the, the one that ranked at the lowest, which was 66%, um, I'm sorry, it was 66% uh, of the participants indicated or responded affirmatively to the question about um, do they, uh, does management seek um, their opinions and respond to that information? Um, and in fairness, uh, what the 66% who said uh, yes, strongly, uh, or very strongly, uh, yes, or um, strongly, there is a high percentage of people who, who are neutral, who didn't have a, a, a negative response to that question. Their, their response was, um, I don't know, or um, neither, neither yes, neither agree nor disagree. It does tell us that there is an opportunity for uh, leadership to uh, continue to do more, to encourage um, or seek uh, employee input, especially on um, areas that affect or impact them directly. Uh, performance management and accountability is the second lowest. And again, 
had a positive response to this. And in fact, uh, the poor work is not tolerated. 68% uh, agreed that that is true. Um, we saw the greatest increase in that response than we had in the prior year. Um, so management is their supervisors are really, uh, you know, ensuring that work is distributed fairly, people are, are um, being held accountable. Uh, so we've, we've improved in this area uh, from 2018 to 2023. Mm -hmm. Um, I get frequent feedback um, on what I do and how I do it was another area that uh, we see that there is an opportunity to continue to provide employees um, uh, feedback. And it's really important to do it in a, in a timely manner. So uh, outside of the whole performance review process, which is a formal uh, process that we do annually, uh, you know, we're going to be encouraging our supervisors and managers to provide more um, on the spot feedback. Um, and I think that that might help employees feel that they're being uh, rec recognized when they're doing well and also um, being um, made aware when things are not great. Uh, communication was another area, uh, again, uh, that was, was actually the third area that scored uh, the lowest. Um, Region keeps me informed, and we have made great strides in this area in the last year. And we um, we see that in the open-ended questions, there's a lot of responses that indicate that they're appreciative of the of the uh, being informed, and um, the general manager coming out and speaking to employees. So we've implemented since Philippe has been here a um, practice of uh, having these quarterly G huddles when he, he goes out to the employees' areas or departments, he briefs them on things that happen here at the board so people are aware and informed um, and any other changes that might be implementing internally. And they're hearing it directly from him. And there's uh, some really good responses in the, in the uh, open-ended uh, comments that affirm that that is um, appreciated. And I won't cover 2018, but here are the themes um, in regards to the open-ended questions. In, in regards to the question about uh, do, what issues, concerns, suggestions do you have? Uh, there were a number of, well, there are a total of 24 responses. So it's not required for an employee to respond to that question, but we had 24 who did. And uh, one common theme was, uh, related to the traffic issue, the traffic flow, do something about the traffic, the traffic isn't working. And so um, uh, the team had already, before we collected the input, we were aware and um, had already been working on a solution. And, um, but the employees, you know, were again, uh, affirming that this was a problem and asking us to do something about it. Uh, accountability, uh, lack of consistency. Uh, there was a couple comments in there, um, a few comments that had to do with um, not everybody being held accountable and things like that. So uh, another theme or, uh, was need to listen, ask questions before making changes. So with a lot of changing managers, supervisors, and things like that, uh, employees were asking us to, or the respondents, some of the respondents were asking us to um, ask before we start changing things. Um, and then there was one very, very articulate, uh, very thoughtful um, uh, comment uh, that really challenges us to do better internally as it relates to environmental stewardship um, and really owning and walking the talk. So I included this, even though it was just one person, because it, it is, um, I feel very courageous to, to point out and tell us we need to do more internally. Um, the open-ended question themes in regard to the question what do you think is working well? And in this, uh, we had 30 responses. Um, 
themes are improved communication from leadership and transparency. I do think that that's attributed to the GM going out in those uh, quarterly huddles um, and the work that Eric has been doing internally on, on you know, translates into uh, the social media and um, information that he's pushing out. He's also sharing it internally. And there's a lot of um, uh, improved communications and those comments are, are included in the, those um, open-ended questions. Uh, new general manager, there's several comments in there about you know, being very happy with their new GM. Um, employee gatherings, lunches, appreciation for, for those activities that we, we continue to do. And uh, uh, there was uh, several comments in regard to uh, expressing appreciation for the change in work culture, uh, camaraderie, uh, employee morale. Uh, so that's all really good input and feedback and uh, indicator that um, we need to continue doing what we're doing. And uh, as I said, overall, really great input, really good feedback. Um, and here are a couple of the sentiments shared that um, made me smile when I read them uh, from um, several of the respondents. All right, so I presented you, well, uh, what's next? So we are gonna share these results with all the employees. Uh, we were holding off, we, know we collected these back in June. I wasn't ready to bring them to you in July and then we had the break, so here we are. Um, but now that you've, you've seen this information, we're gonna go out and share it with the employees. Um, involve employees in defining some of those improvement initiatives. So to their point, management doesn't ask. We're going to come out and ask for them to give us some ideas. What does it look like? What would this, what would it look like for management to be more engaged in soliciting um, input um, in the areas that are ranked lower than we would like? And then also uh, performance management uh, refresher training uh, with uh, all our uh, supervisors, managers uh, to uh, address the uh, comments in regard to accountability, um, you know, ensuring that everybody's trained to, to do that, and then uh, continue the assessments on an ongoing basis. All right, that's the uh, summary. You have all received the raw data in your packets. Um, the, I don't think I included the open-ended responses. Those are available for you if you would like. I'm happy to, to um, forward those. Um, and any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you for that. Perfect. Yes, thank you so much for that. You guys did a lot of work. I know that's a heavy lift. And so I, I really give kudos how the number of employees who participated increase, but also, um, you know, just the, the whole response altogether. Yeah. Um, could you go to, oh, that was the first thing. Um, was this delivered in multiple languages or just English? Spanish and English. Spanish and English, okay, yes. great, thank you. Could you go to the analysis opportunity slide? So I noticed, and I, I know you kind of uh, spoke about this, and it, even to the what's next, you, you kind of already addressed it. But I was just noticing uh, between the 2018 and 2023, how the, the management engagement piece kept coming up. But mm -hmm. I, I noticed that you already addressed that in the next what's next by doing a refresher uh, for for them. Is is there um, that was just a one time refresher, or will you have things that will be kind of sustainable to be able to check in on that? The performance management recognition. So manage the management engagement. Um, we we've done some work in this regard. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, we a couple of years ago we revamped or recreated the employee recognition program, and uh, we uh, formed a a focus group. Um, representatives from the various departments. Um, we all came together to review the existing program and because we were we had realized people aren't recognizing each other we have this we have this reward and they're not giving each other kudos and we know that people are doing good work here and it was the same thing with the not only the peer-to-peer -peer, but the manager to employee and it wasn't 
it had fizzled. So we created the focus group, um, brought in people and asked them, what would, what do you value about your coworkers? What would, what, what would you, um, what do you appreciate about them? And so how would you like to be able to express that appreciation to them? And we created a whole new program with input from the employees. Um, some of the things that we learned from that was uh, the former program um, required the employees. If, I don't know that it really required, but that was a perception. The employees to who wanted to recognize a, a coworker that they do it at the board meeting. So they come up, you know, and people are not comfortable about that. So we created where that we now have these postcards. It's called the High Five Award. Um, all supervisors have these small little postcards. On one side, they they write to and from and why. It does need sign off by the immediate supervisor just to make sure that you know there is some legitimacy there. Mm -hmm. um, and then they get to give it to that person however they want, privately, at their team huddles, at their uh, monthly meetings, however. Um, and then they earn. So uh, you collect these high fives and you earn. Uh, the first one is a, a, a lunch voucher from the food truck, get a lunch. Uh, and then it, you know, once you have three, you get a cap with the high five award logo. Um, and uh, if you collect, I think it's five, you get a hoodie with the high five award. And this is a way for employees, peer to peers to recognize themselves. So this is one, one example of how we ask them to tell us what works. And we will continue to do that. Um, another, our plan based on this is to let's tackle these areas. Let's ask, let's create another focus group potentially and ask uh, them, uh, we, maybe we need to learn a little bit more in regard to the, you know, why do you think the, the response to this question about poor work is tolerated? Mm -hmm. No, my, my question was dealing with the management engagement. So not so much dealing with the recognition and, and that piece because you guys are doing great. But when we're talking about uh, the management not responding to their opinion and their suggestions, that's that's what I was referring so to. So it's that management is not seeking. Mm -hmm. So that the example that I gave you is one way that we did go out and sought. And now this the other example is uh we're, we might create another focus group and go out and, and ask how, what what does this look like? What would this look like to you? What well, what would you like to see, um, and you know how how should you how would you like to submit or um, present uh, suggestions, ideas, things like that? We might have ideas, but we want to ask the employees how what makes sense to them, and then develop some kind of program to do that. So will you address this in your refresher that you <laughs> talked about with, in your what's next? Will you address like to management? How they can be able to or, uh, respond to the different um, uh, team members' um, opinions or suggestions. Uh, will you yeah. address that in the we, refresh report? Yes, we 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 mm -hmm. can cover that as that mm -hmm. within that training. Okay, thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Um, Any else? Other questions? No? I'm, I'm just happy that you do this. Thank Not you. every industry does this type of thing. I think it's really important. Especially for retention and mm -hmm. building a career. Yeah. Thank you. I haven't looked at the raw data, but in the raw data, does it compare 2023? Does it show 2023? I'm oh, sorry, 2018 numbers? Yes. Yes. Uh, you highlighted here the, the, the lowest scores, and to me, two thirds are pretty high. So no, two thirds is they, they it's positive affirmation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So so those are your lowest scores, and two thirds are positive responses, which is really great. Oh yes, mm -hmm. yes. They're your lowest, but your lowest are right. Very high. Mm -hmm. Right. So mm -hmm. I don't I don't see a problem in. Yeah. We're urgently needing to up those numbers. <clears throat> that's great. If you can, you always want to do better. But I just want to say that's fantastic. Thank you. On the on the spot recognition and the uh, the feedback from supervisors to employees, which is some of the lower scores, mm -hmm. which are high. Uh, for me, in my life, it's hard for me to appreciate people on the spot. So I'm just wondering, 
can there be training for supervisors who may not be so verbal or whatever, mm -hmm. where they're just not as comfortable? Some people are great at it, and some people aren't so great at it. But if they got trained, that's a great idea. Be better. Yeah, we can definitely look into that and uh, make that part of the uh, manager supervisor training. Yeah. You think it's a natural, but it's not a natural for me. And yeah, it's not for others. Um, can you give an example or two of uh, internal stewardship improvements that, that one articulate employee suggested? What if I read you their, they, did, they didn't, but I'll read you what they said. That was really impressive. Let me just see what that means. Says, oh no, I had printed it. She didn't, I, I don't, I don't have it. I'm assuming it's a she because it's, it's extremely well-written and very articulate. <laughs> Very articulate. It was nice handwriting. No, it's, it was on it was uh, uh, online anonymous, but you know some of these things like like the comment about I love the district. This is the best place. You I, you, you hear that and you're like I know who said that. <laughs> you know what gender that was. I've been here ten. Years. I I've been here ten years. I talk to everybody, so I kind of have. Oh, well, you know the person. Yeah, I Got think it. I know. Anyway, I don't, I didn't print it. Darn it. Do you recall any examples? Well, but she, she didn't provide examples. She was, it was making a general statement about um, uh, what she's experienced and what she's witnessed. Um, uh, uh, one of the things that um, I keep saying she, uh, <laughs> he or she experienced or witnessed on site, uh, you know, water bottles, for example, were still, we still have them. Mm. We um, and so that's a comment that was made that we need to take more uh, ownership. Okay, I, I wasn't. I don't recall if you had a slide. What could be done better um, on your presentation? You had what was going well, but it, so you had an open-ended question. What could be done better? I guess that's it. Right. That's there. it right there. Okay, mm -hmm. that's probably it. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Um, Thank you, Berta. You're very welcome. This is great. Um, I think Baldo has it. Uh, you know, we need to, I was going to ask, what incentives do you give the employees for filling this out? Um, it seems like they don't really have an incentive, mm -mm. but I think allowing them time to do it is really important. So thank you. Yeah, we, we will definitely do that next year. Um, and then uh, I guess this is in relation to those, your, your low but it's still high question yes. where, where maybe you get a lot of neutrals. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you've ever thought about doing a sort of a sub sub question for like a different question for Merck employees, a different question for land mm -hmm. employees. It just seems like those are very different areas. Mm -hmm. And I, I know writing test questions is very hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, but it, it just seems like maybe having, you know, I, you want to have those same questions that you ask here up here. I think that validates your, mm -hmm. your data that you're getting. But um, I think if, you know, if you want to kind of zero in a little bit more mm -hmm. and have a question that really pertains to that area. To that area, okay. I think might be might be interesting and might give you a little bit more feedback in terms of some of those areas that you're seeing needs a little bit more work, so. Yeah, okay, I will look at that for next time. Thank you. Yeah, and I just like to say, I echo that employee's concern. Uh, whenever I see lots and lots of plastic bottles being handed out at events, uh, it's not a very good example. Mm -hmm. We could maybe move towards filling stations, and I don't know how much opportunity there is to keep your own uh, glass or bottle someplace safe when you're working, say, on the line. So that might be a concern. But I do think you have to model the behavior you want to see. So mm -hmm. if the district could start to think in those directions of start small, yes. but make those steps of modeling the behavior because all of the employees here go home mm -hmm. and then they would and hopefully, you know, do that in their private lives at home and maybe influence their family and friends and neighbors as well. So yes, I think that person is probably right. Mm -hmm. I know we've had to move away from plastic at uh, our city council meetings and we have paper cups and pitchers of water instead and it works just fine. But um, I know it's just a small step, but mm -hmm. it models a behavior that you want to So this is one of our strategic priorities for this year that the leadership team was already looking at. 
of implementing uh, uh, improving our, our internal program on um, uh, sustainability and recycling and um, composting and, and the such. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Verda. You're welcome. Okay, moving on to staff reports, review finance, operating, and recycling reports. That's correct. Uh, all right, good morning, everybody. Well, we've been through the first two months of fiscal 2024, and uh, generally things are looking pretty positive in terms of the revenue. Uh, our tip fee revenue was a 6.6 .6 million. Uh, we were about 120,000 below plan, and that's primarily July for various reasons was a slower month with tip fees. Uh, however, we picked that up a lot of that in, in uh, August. So year to date, we're, as I say, we're about 6.6 .6 million and, and slightly under for the, for the year. Uh, the other sales are, are above plan and particularly the MRF. So it's nice to see the MRF, you know, coming back a little bit above plan. However, we're still about $350,000 less than we were for the same two months last year. So the MRF is still kind of struggling in terms of you know, selling selling their products. Um, if we look at the tip fee revenue a little more closely, I know we, we've talked about this a little bit in the past as to what's the breakdown of where the tip fees are coming from. So we, we have it sort of categorized into different areas. One's the franchise revenue, which is the, the tip fees that come from the franchise cities. And that's about 26% of the total tip fee revenue. And then there's our, our regional revenue. And those are the customers that we have contracts with, and then you're looking at, at Green Waste, uh, Recology, Republic, uh, some of the, uh, the local cities in Santa Cruz County, and that's about 43% of, of the tip fee revenue, and the other 31% is the commercial and self haul revenue that, that comes in. In terms of our operating expenses, we are uh, slightly over plan year to date about $216,000. Uh, the biggest item in the operating expenses year to date is our uh, environment, what we call environmental services. And that has to do with primarily with the landfill gas operation. So we, we've had, we had some uh, air permit costs that we incurred in the first two months. And we've also had uh, you know, slightly higher costs in terms of the maintenance and repair of the landfill gas operation. Um, Year to date, our net income is about 1.5 million, and we're about 47 k under under budget for the year. So we're we're pretty close. We're we're I say in pretty good shape in terms of the budget. Um, just backing up a bit in terms of our revenue numbers. Uh, one other metric we look at is how much of our revenue is coming from tip fees versus everywhere else. Uh, yeah, this year we're about 69 percent of the revenue was tip fees, and last year it was 75 percent. Uh, as I've mentioned before, you know, the, the ideal objective would be try to get more to a 50-50 balance between tip fees and, and all the other revenue. Um, and that's that's kind of a challenging thing to get to. It's, it's largely dependent on how things go with the MRF and, and, and how their product sales are going. Uh, in terms of uh, our operations, we've received so far this year uh, about... Um, about 17,000 tons more than we did in the same two month period last year. Uh, our diversion percentage is still uh, hovering around 60% in total for the MRF. Um, and that number has been pretty consistent actually for the past few years. It hasn't really changed a lot. Um, and that's where we are year to date. Any questions? Be happy to take them. I actually have one question on your graph. In the packet, fiscal 2024 total revenue, and it has disposal revenue actual, and it has it's a bar graph. It's got four different colors, but I I don't know what these other the blue is the disposal revenue actual, but I don't know what the other colors represent. Uh, yeah, that's that was kind of a slip up there on the legend. So the the uh, yellow or gold that would be the uh, the MRF related revenue, okay. and the green is the power. Okay. Revenue, and then the uh, the other smaller one is the other revenue, which is our sand sales and our HHW okay. fees that we collect. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll talk to the person that did that graph. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> 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 
right. Any any other questions? Yeah, it's kind of a high level question. Uh, and we have a goal of getting 50 50, only 50% of our revenue being tip, tipping fees. And you mentioned it's going to be challenging. And how realistic is that goal? You know, are we ever going to get there? And, and they, do we need to be more realistic and have a reduction that we can actually achieve? I think 50 50 is incredibly optimistic because um, that would expect that the MRF. Act, uh, activity is going to increase dramatically because certainly we don't want our tip fee revenue to go down. You know, if anything, we want to you know continue going up. Um, so I, I think 50 50 is, is extremely ambitious and maybe something more like 60 40 would be more practical to, to ultimately get to. And you said it's been about 65 percent for a long time, yeah. It's, it's it well, it's been as high as like 75 percent. When when the uh, MRF was just getting started up a few years ago, it was you know, seventy five plus percent. It's it's been getting as low as the high sixties, and that's that's the best we've seen. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of it's driven by how the MRF is performing and the revenue we're able to get for the the MRF products. So, is there any high hanging fruit or low hanging fruit that comes to mind that we haven't picked to try to get there? Well, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of control over the MRF revenue in terms of the product sales. You know, we sell the products for whatever the market price is for those items. And, you know, the, those fluctuate up and down. It's kind of like the stock market. Uh, you know, they're, they're commodity items. So sometimes the, the prices are higher. And then sometimes we may actually have certain materials like mixed paper as an example where we actually, it's actually a negative price, meaning we have to pay somebody to come take it away. Um, and we don't really have any influence over that. All our, our material, uh, we sell through brokers. And so the brokers are uh, you know, getting, ideally, the best price they can for the material. So are other revenues pretty maxed out? You know, uh, over gas revenues or other power generation, those are too small to make a, a, a big dent in this? Yeah, the, the power revenue is you know is probably going to be in the you know two and a half million dollar range pretty much annually, and there's probably not a lot of area for improvement there. Uh, but it's good you know steady revenue that we can uh, look forward to getting. Uh, the other revenue part is is relatively small. You know, the sand revenue and the HHW fees so also really know much. So there. it sounds like our board just needs to readjust so that we're not shooting for something that's. <laughs> Not realistic. And like Eric Palmer said earlier, you know, stay authentic. That would be more authentic to have a more realistic yeah. projection. Uh, so, quick question. In August, it shows for outside services cost that it, it was 38000 um, over budget that was due to temporary, um, a high temporary employee cost. Was there a reason why we were using a lot of uh, more temporary um, employees? Probably the biggest uh, contributor to that is, uh, as we talked about in recent meetings, uh, we have brought in, we're bringing in material from the Cole Canyon facility in the southern part of the state uh, in cooperation with the, uh, the business that operates that landfill. And because of that additional material that came in, you know, we had to employ more temporary employees. This, and this is all activity happening at the MRF. You know, they've, they've had to work uh, more on Saturdays and more. We've had more overtime. We've also had higher temp costs at processing that material that came in. Okay. And, and yeah. as, you, as you may you know, that was a one off situation. So that's that situation is, pretty, is over now. We're not going to see it. There'll, there'll still be some impact likely in September, mm -hmm. but the whole program is finished. So do we plan that in um, with when we are looking at uh, like the budget and the and the goals that we're making, knowing that these uh, pieces are coming up, or is it something that this is unexpected? I think well, at the time we did the budget, no, we did not budget this at this kind of case. So it's just an unexpected, unexpected. But, you know, they approached us and asked if we would be willing to take some material from them because they were doing some work on their MRF and they were going to be shut down for a period of time, and so they needed they needed to have some place to be able to send uh, their material. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, did you want to add something? Well, I was going to add some um, perspective to uh, Mayor Delgado's comments regarding uh, the transition of uh, revenues in relationship with disposal versus other. Um, I concur with uh, Garth that uh, that is an extremely 
um, an ambitious goal, and it may not be one that the board wants to hold on to long term. Um, the sentiment behind it is to, um, uh, you know, uh, transition from having dependency on um, the disposal revenues because you know the disposal uh, activity is an activity that's being promoted to decline as recycling and beneficial reuse increases. So there's in, in that promotional policy uh, theme, there's a, a perspective that there's going to be decreasing revenues over time. Um, so the, the focus may be on uh, gaining revenues in other areas. The electricity uh, concur with Gar's comment, you know, there's not much room to what can be done today, but there is a project that's in construction um, to connect the regen power plant to Monterey One Water's advanced water treatment uh, purification facility. And that will come with a, a, a significant effective change in the rate of the power sale. So at, at that point in time, when the connection's made and it's online, there will be an increase in, uh, uh, in the power sale sales that's going to be north of 20%, and uh, it'll, it'll help change this relationship. Do you have an estimate how much it'll change? Like going from 60, <clears throat> 65 to 70%, it'll reduce it by 5% or 10%? Or two well, um, so let's see here. Real quick, try to do the math in my head. Um, it's effectively uh, a fifty percent increase in our uh, unit rate of you know unit price of sale, um, and uh, we'll probably be able to accomplish at least uh, fifty percent of the energy sales. So you know you're looking at twenty five percent revenue increase. Uh, just just right there and and so that's that's uh uh an, about five hundred thousand dollars on the two million dollar uh, annual rate yeah at least at least 500k so what would that do to our 65 to 70 percent uh not much so if that's our best uh fruit that we haven't plucked and it's not going to do much then it's back to the point that we probably need to relook at being more uh approximate Do you suppose that we could emphasize more of the things that we want to hit the recycle bin, the things that we have markets for, like aluminum? I understand aluminum cans are in and out and made into something else very quickly, but not as many aluminum cans are being recycled as should be. Yet we have all kinds of plastics that can't even be recycled being thrown into our bins because people think they're being made into something. So I think, you know, there's some problem that we have created with our re our aspirational recycling is that we don't have products being made out of those. And it hasn't helped reducing your use. When people think they can throw it in that blue bin and it's going to go somewhere good, they think, mm -hmm. they don't reduce their consumption. So maybe our messages have to change a little bit too, so they become more realistic and less aspirational, and that we're getting products put into those bins that we want to be put there, emphasizing that. Mike, you're right. And I think you know the work that Eric's doing and the whole communications team is is working on that. And that process has improved, I would say, dramatically over the past, you know, half dozen years at least, to get people more aware of what goes where. And you know, just putting it in the blue bin and hoping that it's gonna end up someplace good is is not the way to do it. No, especially if we're having to pay to take certain things away and put them somewhere else that well, probably yeah. didn't belong in that bin to begin well, with. No, they, well, they, belo they, not, you know, they belonged in the bin. You know, they are technically recyclable materials. However, there is just not much demand for those particular products. 
Well, isn't there going to be some new labeling coming? They're going to not allow some things that are labeled now with a little triangle to be labeled forever if they're not re truly recyclable. Yeah, it's true. But we, we still end up with all a, a wide variety of different products. And, you know, I, I just use mixed paper as an example because that seems to be the consistent one <clears throat> that goes into a negative pricing mm -hmm. situation where we actually have to pay somebody to come and take it away. The other stuff, we still sell. We still get money for it. But, you know, the price per ton can fluctuate dramatically. Mm -hmm. and, and we just have to, we, you know, we get whatever the market will pay for that mm -hmm. material. Mm -hmm. So did you want to add? Yeah, I had a comment, um, Director Salito. I think you, you hit on something um, that our education team is working on on a regular basis. There's a, a broad population in this area that we're serving, and we have everyone from uh, folks who are really good at doing the right thing or want to do the right thing and maybe uh, wish cycling uh, and adding more things to the blue bin um, than should be there. We also have uh, in our population folks that maybe aren't considering what should be recycled and are dumping things that are recyclable in the trash. Um, and your board approved a landfill characterization study that's underway at this very moment um, to help us understand what is recyclable that is ending up in the trash. So we'll have some really great data coming up soon um, from each of your cities and county um, to tell us what it is that we're missing and where more education needs to be done to get items that are truly recyclable in the recyclable bin. Um, and be able to target target messaging a little bit more effectively that way. Thank you. Yeah, Wendy, I appreciate the conversation a lot. And I think it does tie back into the earlier comments um, about uh, what are the big systemic changes that need to be made. Um, you know, commodity sales, I think, you know, we've got stuff that is recyclable, we train people. I just recognize how, you know, there are folks that are really paying attention and trying to do the right thing. And it's hard enough when you're trying to do the right thing. And then I recognize whole whole parts of at least my community, like you're just busy. You've got, you know, a kid crying, you've got, you know, the, the you're working two jobs. Like mm -hmm. it's just a lot of stuff and there's just not capacity to take in this constantly changing space of like what goes where um, as much as you may want to. Yeah. And so the ways that we can systemically simplify it and make it really clear whether it's on packaging. And if that's something that we could take on a larger role from an advocacy perspective to have those big picture, you know, where is the source of the recycled so recyclables coming from? Where is the source of the trash coming from? And how do we make it so easy that it's not something that requires you to be like adding on additional uh, mental capacity and mental load? Because I just know like sometimes it's just too much. Um, as much as we may want to do the right thing and as, with as much education that comes to us, there's still limits to what, um, what people are going to be able to do. Uh, so I just I think there's a lot there and there's a role for us to play and and in that larger conversation. And this is a this is to your point, it's a statewide conversation. And there is a, a law that you've mentioned, Director Ferlito, a truth and labeling law that is uh, passed in the state of California that will help with those chasing arrow symbols only on truly recyclable items. Mm -hmm. And what that does is it looks at what is recyclable broadly not just at a particular facility, but broadly, and those items that are truly recyclable will be able to retain that label, but items that are not big one plastic bags will not be able to retain that label anymore. Um, same thing with compostable products. And even with those labels, it's a commodity sales situation. So once we're putting the education out, like our dynamic of what we can count on for sales or not sales, I mean, that's a constantly changing thing. So even with, it helps us get us closer but, but still there's, there's a fluctuation that's going to occur. But it also affects our labor market because when we have so much stuff coming in that has to be sorted and so much of that is thrown away, that is just that much more material dumped on that conveyor belt that is costing us time and labor and materials and possible uh, even um, accidental things that are there. So it really does pay for this country to get it together as to what we're going to do with all this material that we just keep producing. We have to have some new industry to use up or 
you know, change some of this back into oil or whatever it is that they have to do, but we're drowning in plastic. Well, <laughs> Peter, other point. All the things you just said don't alter consumption. It just alters the type of product that's recyclable or not. So to the extent that we're not focused on bigger issues and we're focused on what goes in the blue bin, we're probably missing the point, yeah. but it makes everybody feel good because yeah. it's a little bit more tangible. But the big the big changes are, are what's really needed. And if we're not communicating those very effectively. We're kind of fiddling around while Rome burns. But, right. Well, maybe reduce should be a big theme and yeah. uh, alternatives like this. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you, Garth. Okay. Welcome. All right, our next item is the report on the Technical Advisory Committee and SB 1383, July 12th, 2018. Thank you. Good morning, Thank you. Chair, members of the board. Um, yeah, I am here to report on the July Technical Advisory Committee. So some of these items have already come before your board at the July meetings. We as a Technical Advisory Committee uh, tend to meet in advance of this meeting. So I'll um, hit on a couple things a little bit in a little bit more detail and skip over some things that your board is very familiar with. Um, the first item is uh, we have a request for approval. We have a final, a final um, now for the Cal Recycle Local Assistant Grant Program. It's a second round of funding that's coming to your cities and county for SB 1383 compliance. In uh, February of 2022 or spring of 2022, um, funding came to your counties and that was pooled or to your county and cities and that was pooled. Each member jurisdiction saw roughly $20,000 worth of funding. Um, that funding was remitted to Regen and Salinas Valley Recycles to allocate in a coordinated way to meet um, different portions of the mandate of SB 1383. So this is a second round of funding that Cal Recycle has approved. Um, there is an update since this memo was written in that the initial cycle, like I said, was a $20,000 base funding amount. Um, it is now not $50,000, but $75,000 base amount for each of the cities. And that's what we expect for each of the cities in this area. There may be a little bit more because uh, per capita, if there's excess funding left over, a little bit more is able to come to each city. So expect around $75,000. Uh, the county of Monterey is receiving $189,000 uh, based upon population. And in total, um, uh, the region half of the county is receiving $600,000 in funding. Uh, Salinas Valley Recycles is receiving $579,000 worth of funding. And we mention that because we do pool all of this funding money on a countywide basis uh, where the programs line up. Um, so much of this funding is going to be used in a coordinated effort for the entire county. And that's totaling $1.369 million. So that's fantastic news for us to be able to continue to support all of the programs that uh, SB 1383 uh, mandates your jurisdiction to provide. Uh, so we're still looking through some of the opportunities for this grant program to figure out um, areas that we want to expend the funds. Uh, some of the top areas that we're looking at right now are procurement of compost. Your jurisdictions are required to buy back compost uh, as a part of SB 1383 so far. Um, because of this grant funding, you've not spent any money on that, and we'd like to continue that trend. We don't want to see your costs suddenly spike up, um, so we're going to look at procurement as being an item that we'd like to continuously cover. Um, and then another item uh, we're looking at is education, and we're trying to drill down on where we want the most education to be targeted at this point between commercial, single-family, and multifamily. So just a couple highlights. Um, Item number two is the edible food recovery generator inspections. So Cal Recycle identifies uh, what they call tier one and tier two generators of edible food. Tier one is uh, large venues, grocery stores, hotels with food service, that sort of thing. Uh, and they make sure that there is indeed food recovery happening at those uh, organizations. Many of those have uh, contracts in place already with the Food Bank of Monterey County, uh, or other large entities to ensure that edible food is being donated to people who need it. Um, tier two are smaller uh, entities. They're um, more like restaurants, like large restaurants. Um, and we're working with Blue Strike Environmental to conduct these inspections to do outreach to these tier one and tier two generators 
ensure that they know what's required of them by law and they're providing record keeping and they have these processes in place to donate edible food. Item number three, uh, this came before your board, uh, so we'll just briefly touch on it. Uh, between SBR, Selene Scholar Recycled, and Region Monterey, uh, we had an excess amount of money that was left over in a grant funding opportunity to provide capacity, additional capacity to store edible food for feeding organizations. So uh, with the flooding that happened in uh, Pajaro, we decided that Pajaro Valley Loaves and Fishes would be a really great entity to donate that additional funding to. And they received a check for uh, $10,025 combined funding, 4,000 of which, uh, 4,025 of which came from Regen and 6,000 from Salinas Valley Recycles. Um, and there is a thank you letter in the back of your packet, by the way, uh, for that funding. They were able to hire an additional staff member um, to help serve the needs of the community during that time. Um, uh, item number four is just a notification that we are providing a second round of billing for the pooled costs for SB 23 per our MOU mm -hmm. with all of the member jurisdictions. And item number five uh, is an update on the fact that we submitted um, the 2022 Cal Recycle electronic annual reports on behalf of your member agencies. Those were all submitted um, successfully, and Kristen does a wonderful job with those. So, out yeah. to Kristen, she puts all the data together and makes sure that Power Cycle is getting the information they need on an annual basis. Item number six is a Green Waste Recovery uh, webinar. Um, Green Waste Recovery uh, had a webinar available for the public, both in English and Spanish, two separate webinars actually back to back, um, that helped members of the public uh, learn about participating in food scrap collection. There's some people that are ahead of the curve and have been doing it for two years, and there's some people that are still trying to get their feet wet with this. Um, so this was a nice webinar that was available, allowed the public to ask questions uh, about how to participate and give tips and tricks. And the last item was an invitation for our technical advisory committee to uh, attend the Regen and CTOS biochar launch event that we had after the board meeting in July. With that, I'm happy to respond to any questions you may have. Questions for You mentioned uh, the Blue Stripe team. Do they do site inspections during large uh, community events like golf events, the Gunasaka events, you know, the bigger events of our county? They do. That's separate from what's happening here and not funded by us, but as a part of uh, their uh, nonprofit organization, that is the service that they provide to the community and they um, utilize our services here mm -hmm. as well for uh, disposal, recycling and composting. So the mm -hmm. products from those events do wind right. up coming here in a source separated way. Are the reports from those special event inspections available to the public? Um, that's a good question. I would reach out to Blue Strike Environmental directly on those. Um, they do provide, I believe, information and how they are making events zero waste um, and the methodology with which they do so. So I reach out to them as to, I know there's at least six events uh, on the Monterey Peninsula that they support. I, I asked because I volunteered at a concession air stand to sell hot food and drinks at a big event recently, which was super well-funded and that one of the most expensive events we have. And uh, from, from the perspective we're talking today, mm -hmm. there was no training. There's hundreds of volunteers at this event in these concession stands, about 10 concession stands, generating a ton of organics and plastics. And it's all mixed up behind the concession stands where if anyone were to make use of it, it would have to be thoroughly sorted from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. It looks kind of like a single family residence bin that's 33% contaminated or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so at the big events, are performing like that and the hundreds of volunteers are learning or not learning how to discard things mm -hmm. it's there's a lot of room for improvement but that's not going to happen unless there's somebody paying attention to the reports maybe something some independent uh, auditors paying attention to the reports because internally it may never be a high priority of the event organizers they're doing whatever they're doing racing or golf or whatever they're not you know, it's, yeah, like mm -hmm. like uh, Ken, like director asked you said, there's different levels of uh, motivation, and sometimes these big events might not have that motivation depending on the top down. Correct. Yeah, I think that the motivation does need to start with the event organizers to um, have host sustainable events and promote sustainable events as uh, a part of what they're doing 
uh, and giving back to the community. And it starts there, definitely. And that requires a big commitment, um, as I know you know. Um, and that is boots on the ground uh, and people at waste stations to make sure that proper sorting is happening, training in advance is happening, and that the materials are clean and properly sorted at the events. Um, otherwise, like you said, there's so much contamination that it's not able to be uh, diverted in the way that the event organizers. In, in this case, there were very few signs. There was absolutely zero monitoring of the customer, the event participant going yeah. to the event of drawing. So I'm looking at the events and there's just a complete, you know, uh, overlap of garbage, organics, and recycling people, you know. They need to have monitors, right? Yes. Just like they have monitors inside the concessionaire stand because they're handling money and they're keeping food safe, stuff like that. But there's nothing on the waste end. I, I think that would be really good. And I would say there's probably different events that are doing different levels of that throughout Monterey County from, you know, races at Laguna Seca to many of the music festivals that happen here to smaller events at Custom House Plaza. We had uh, we had West End recently. We promoted reusables as a part of that event. Mm -hmm. And we're going to continue to hammer on on reusables uh, instead of single use items to the extent possible. Um, but yeah, diverting as much material as we can from the landfill, and it's it's not an easy job. And people are focused on having fun when they're attending those events, so we need to yeah help them to realize the importance. And I've seen the event that the uh, that the city hosted for the bike track, the pump track, and how reusables were were promoted at that event, and a lot of diversion. So kudos to you for leading the charge there and, and as well as the MLK event. I think you know what's needed. <laughs> it's absolutely not easy to do large events unless you really are committed to creating a sustainable event. The marathon started in 2009 doing diversion and every waste station is manned by volunteers and it has to be because even... <laughs> Even when the volunteers are there, people are like, you know, they've just competed in an event and they're tired and they just want to mm -hmm. get rid of stuff. But it really takes commitment. It takes mm -hmm. commitment ordering and paying more for certain materials that are better. And, uh, you know, at one time the state had a requirement that large events had to do diversions. I forget what the, the number was, but... You know, AT and T started doing it after the marathon, and um, I think Blue Strike takes care of four or five events, but not all big events do it. It's just easier to put it in a dumpster and send it away. And unless there's a, re a really strong requirement that your large event, based on size or whatever, has to have a sustainable component, it won't happen for most. But it has to have sustainable. A commitment to the level that Zoe's talking about. Absolutely. You have to have a person staffing each waste station. Absolutely. Now, in the case I can tell you at the marathon, if a bin gets contaminated, it all gets resorted at the very end anyway. Ooh. There's a resorting place where every bin is emptied and and cleansed of what is the most obvious, but that does take a huge amount of volunteerism and a lot of commitment mm -hmm. and more that should be required. We have a lot of big events in this peninsula and this county, and we should be really pushing that sustainability. Get on it, Zoe. <laughs> I'll help. <laughs> I promise you that. So I just had one quick question. Yeah. Um, on the Green Waste Recovery webinar, I was just curious how well it was attended. I'm wondering if that is a is a good avenue for outreach? Um, I think it was really positive. I do know that in advance of the event, uh, they had staff at the farmer's markets that were promoting the event, collecting yeah. email addresses, making sure folks knew about the event. Yeah. They also took out ads in local newspapers. Um, so I think it was well promoted. Uh, in terms of attendance, oh, I'd have to, I want to say it was around 30 for the English event. I actually wasn't able to log into the Spanish event. Um, I tried to, but I think I didn't have the, it wasn't the same URL okay. or the same login. Um, but it was, it was a really well conducted uh, webinar. And uh, we can check also to see if that's something that they put on their uh, website to view post, mm -hmm. uh, because I think that's, that's another a uh, key factor is not how many views you get during the time when the event is hosted. It was held in the evening, so it was after work for most people. Um, but being able to watch it uh, back, you know, probably get, I would say, more views, <laughs> you know, 
uh, for people to be able to watch it in their own leisure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. That brings up a question. Do the farmers markets contribute to the salvageable food, like at the end of the day when they don't want to take it all the way back to Modesto or wherever? Is there an opportunity for them? I'm sure there's an opportunity. I don't know if that's currently being done. Um, so there's multi, there's the edible food recovery um, component of SB 1383 is multifaceted in Monterey County. We're not trying to rewrite the playbook. And there's certainly big players and small players in this field that already know what is needed in this community. These feeding, report, feeding recovery organizations, we're not trying to do the work for them. We're trying to support them uh, with uh, financially, you know, with uh, ways that they can expand their own services and also with connectivity. Um, so one of the things that we've just launched this year, uh, and it's just in its infancy, is a new app called Carrot, C-A-R-E-I-T. Um, I encourage you to download it and check it out. It's Like I said, it's still in its infancy. Um, but what it does is it allows the food recovery organizations to connect directly with these uh, edible food generators, the tier one and two edible food generators that we're doing outreach to. So they can say, I have a tray of lasagna, for example. And it might be a tray of lasagna that the food bank for Monterey County doesn't see as fit for them to drive a whole truck out to pick up that one tray of lasagna and bring it all the way back. But there might be a local um, a local kitchen or something like that, that says we can use that lasagna and I have people that I can feed that to. Nice. Um, so providing that connectivity is a part of the work that we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Going on to other correspondence, that was the uh, thank you letter from Fishes and Loads. Um, and then going to General Manager Communications, Ellen. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, we have quite a bit of comments for you this morning. Uh, first and foremost, let me, uh, I'm happy to introduce the new Assistant Director of Operations, Jameson Fister. So, uh, he comes to us with excellent industry experience, having held roles in engineering and operations at Waste Connection and Waste Management. Uh, most recently, he was the site manager of John Smith Road Landfill and had direct oversight and uh, environmental compliance, uh, operations and equipment maintenance. And prior to that, he was the site engineer uh, for Petrera Hills Landfill and John Smith Landfill and a business unit engineer as an assistant project manager for waste management. He holds a degree or a bachelor's in civil engineering and is a licensed professional civil engineer. Uh, we are happy to have him here at Regen filling the very important role as assistant director of operations. Excellent. Uncharted territories for me. Thank you for having me today here. Uh, directors, uh, very happy to be here. I um, pretty much uh, 40 years of my life, I've lived in this Monterey Bay area. I call it home, so I'm very excited. I'm a resident on the peninsula here, and to um, be at this facility, I've been able to meet a lot of great people thus far. I'm very excited to um, bring my skill set and uh, professional experience and help this team um, continue to do the good work that they're doing out here. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Next, we have another introduction. We have Franco Guzman, um, who is our newest member for the Communication and Public Education team. Oh, and we <laughs> will be working closely with the schools to add organic collection to comply with SB 1383. Yeah. Uh, we are fortunate to have Franco as he comes from an industry with a wealth of knowledge as an environmental educator, previously working with green waste recovery. In his free time, Franco enjoys kayaking, scuba diving, and exploring the beautiful Monterey. Good. So, welcome. Anybody go? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We yeah. have two. Oh, 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 would you like to say anything? Uh, just thank you for having me here. <laughs> <laughs> I love working in the environment, so it's helpful to, it's a patch of mine to be able to help others. So. Yeah, awesome. Great, Welcome. thank you. So um, just to uh, inform you, we have uh, two agreements that are, are set to expire. One of them is the California Department of Parks and Recreation. We had a three-year agreement with them, and we will be bringing a 
new agreement um, for uh, finance committee and the board uh, for consideration at the next board meeting in October. And the second agreement um, that is set to expire is the one with waste management with a single stream recycling. And that template draft agreement will be presented to the finance committee for consideration at the board committee board meeting in October as well. Uh, the next item we have is the West End. We had a wonderful uh, time at the West End celebration where we have been tinkling for many years to educate the public about our community services and answer recycling question. It was very well attended. And, and poor Zoe was uh, being pulled many Lucky ways. Lucky Zoe. <laughs> <laughs> as well as the team. And uh, I, I think the the team for it was very voluntary uh, services. There it wasn't, you know, they didn't have to to do it, but they did it, um, and it was well done. Uh, so this year we uh, continue to push to encourage food scrap collections at home and businesses. We distributed over four hundred uh, food scrap bins, and so you got one, use it, and put it in your recycling bin, the the proper one, which is the green waste. <laughs> <laughs> And then we also gave out over a thousand reusable steel cups, and it was uh, very nice to see that it was well used during the event. Um, we, uh, let's see what else is there with that. Um, and they were able to redeem for beer. So there you go. <laughs> so thank you to those businesses and, and your generosity and committing to the sustainability of this. Um, as you are aware, we had some uh, website security issues uh, this past month. Uh, we are working with our website provider to remedy the security concerns that are we've experienced in the last uh, this past month. So I think we've gotten it under control, but we're continuing to monitor that. Um, we are also we have an application with the California Regional Resilience Planning Grant. Um, it's a $650,000 grant application uh, was filed last week for funding uh, of continued planning activities for the Joint Disability Study Renewal Energy Elements. And that's the uh, Joint Disability um, Study that we have with NYWD. So um, the program funds regional climate resilient efforts. Uh, including identifying uh, climate resilience priorities, building capacity, and implementing projects that respond to the region's greatest climate risk. The grant team consists of M1W as the lead applicant, region as a partner, and United Way, Monterey County as a community-based organization. And then we have a uh, Module 7 landfill liner construction. Uh, we have reached a design subgrade elevation in most areas of the module, and the contractor has improved the groundwater seepage and dewatering to allow construction to reach subgrade elevations. And uh, we have quite a bit going on there. Um, we had a challenges are being actively managed by the project team, design and contractor owner to address the issues, all project requirements, environmental standards, and applicable regulations. So we will continue to give you updates on that. Um, so more to come as we, as the construction progresses and mitigation measures implemented and revised timelines on a periodic, periodic basis. Uh, last week, uh, we recently uh, submitted the Title V annual report, which is uh, the federal air permit requirements. And when we submitted it, we submitted it with a number of operational and administrative uh, related deviation reports. The report is presently under review by local and federal representatives, and staff is addressing the deviation in several ways, including but not limited to staff training and guidance, structuring of the compliance plan that will be defined for the new digital compliance platform, uh, mapistry recently approved by the board and the development of a proposal for a pilot study to assess the applicability and benefits of automated controls at the landfill and gas collecting mills. Um, then we have the pilot study for the automated LFG well control system related to the Title 5 annual report. 
Uh, we're coordinating with the left side control to design a pilot study uh, to investigate and assess the use of the uh, automated control. And uh, we anticipate providing more information to the finance committee and the board in our October and May So uh, more to come on that. Um, in August, the communication and public team was able to attend the California Resource Recovery Association. Uh, you can record it that on that um, conference virtually and in person in Burlingame. The team was able to tour Rethink Waste, known as South Bay Side Waste Management Authority in San Carlos. Their state of the art MERV and organic transfer station displayed how Rethink Waste is serving the Bay Area. They share some of the same processing challenges, such as receiving batteries from the blue recycling cart. Additionally, the, tier, the team toured the Blue Line Transfer Station in South San Francisco, where their anaerobic digesters operate with minimal impact, surrounded by Silicon Valley tech companies. I guess that's, is that similar to our body chart? Sorry? Is that similar to our body chart? No. No. Um, on the tours, region was recognized a few times by Rethink Waste and Blue Line as an innovative leader in the waste industry. So, you know, to the team. And then um, in on your desk, uh, there is a flyer for an evening of coke with Paul Hawkins. So it is on October 25th, 4 to 7 p.m. at CSUMB. So mark your calendars. He is a world-renowned environmentalist, entrepreneur, visionary, and New York Times best-selling author. He shares his vision for ending the climate crisis in one, gen in one generation. The event is being hosted by Communities for Sustainable Monterey County and the Rotary Club of Monterey County, Canary Row. Oh, yeah, Club, Rotary Club of Monterey Canary Row. Region Monterey is presenting sponsor and has tickets available to board members if you are interested in attending. So please just let us know and we we'll are happy to be fun that. And lastly, we have concluded our, our contract with Cold Canyon Plant. Uh, originally, the board had uh, authorized 2,500 and max in the agreement and came in well under that 1,540 tons. Okay. And that concludes. All right. Thank you, Helen. Um, all right. Board communications. Anyone from the board? Please communicate. Jerry. Yeah, I think um, everything you've done in here is beautiful. It's, uh, you know, the painting, the pictures, um, the window treatment really looks nice. Although some of them can go up a little bit on the top. <laughs> That's just a minor observation. But other than that, everything looks nice. Thanks for the regen cups that you provided. It'd be nice if we got hats like um, Supervisor Wendy got, but I guess <laughs> we're a little bit further down on the pole. So we'll get you a hat, Barry. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I agree. Looks looks wonderful in here. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, driving in today, I was so excited to see the uh, the employees charged with cleaning up. You know, picking up litter on the way in. And I honked at them. That's what you're never for. <laughs> yeah. So whoever whoever knows those people, please tell them I'm sorry. I did say that. I should have just said thank you without beeping the horn. And, but it's great to see them. I mean, it's not just today. I'm just, they're doing it a lot, but I honked at them today and said thank you and scared them. <laughs> Don't do that. And thanks to the crew for doing that, Jay. Um, I have something I wanted to ask. Um, I announced at our last city council meeting about the issue of the batteries that cause fires in the mm -hmm. landfill. And if um, you provided us with a little uh, more official blurb of exactly what happens and what you went said. I think we could all inform our constituents about the, the danger about it. So I think that that would be very helpful. The other thing that would be very helpful is if you'd send out the names of our two new employees and the little blurb that you read, it's very hard to catch it all quickly in an oral report. So I think that that would be nice so that we would have that information. Thank you. 
And the room does look great. And I agree with Jerry, a couple of them need that. <laughs> Jerry, maybe I got the hat because I made a TikTok about putting your batteries in the right spot to be picked up. Uh, <laughs> I heard that. Uh, you gotta get a TikTok account. Yeah. Well, I, I did provide the West End event for. Well, for okay. The next <laughs> <laughs> More of region out there. Uh, I'll bring in my head. You get a lunch. Well, I have extra large head, so I, I don't know the other spots that would fit me. So. <laughs> Okay, we're going to um, move into closed session. So we have two items um, that we're going to be addressing uh, the conference with property negotiators today, and then um, looking at uh, labor negotiations um, for our general manager. So if there's any public comments for these closed sessions? Session items? Okay. Can we have five minutes dial right? Yes, please. Yeah, the board met this morning on the two matters that were listed on the agenda. The first matter was a conference with uh, property negotiation uh, negotiators to discuss uh, acreage lease to the Keith Day Company. Uh, concerning that matter, the board uh, received information and no reportable action was taken on that matter this morning. Uh, the second matter uh, the board met on this morning was a conference with labor negotiation nego negotiators uh, with uh, the matter of the compensation for the unrepresented employee, the general manager. Uh, concerning that matter, the board received information, provided direction, and uh, no reportable action was taken this morning on that matter. So that concludes my report. <laughs>